Hello, everybody. If it's Wednesday, it's Warhammer, and that must mean it's time for another episode of Warhammer Weekly. Joining me, as always, is my own engagement. I met him. We're engaged. It's a lifelong partnership. It's Tom. How you doing, buddy? I am never going to get rid of him. Hello, friend. <laughs> also joining us back on the show again, one of my favorite people in the world, Mr. Steve Herner, the TO of the Holy Events and an all-around fantastic guy. How you doing, buddy? Hi, thanks for having me. Sorry for the late start, everybody. That's my fault. So. <laughs> <laughs> not my fault this time. It's not, it's not Tom's Tom. fault. Not Tom. Not Tom. All up to no. me. I, I figured since today was a holiday in the U.S., with us going a little late, I don't really care. Normally, I have a very early meeting on Thursdays. Like, I have a regular work meeting on Thursdays that is egregiously early in the morning. So most Wednesday nights, I just don't sleep much at all. It's fine. I don't sleep much at all. Anyways, but this is even exceptionally low by my standards. But today, <laughs> whatever. It's Freedom Day. So happy Freedom Day, everybody. Or if you're in a country that's not America, happy nothing. If you're in the U.K., Happy losing day, as I said last week, which apparently was really caught. So that's great. Um, so we'll just, I feel like I wouldn't, I'd have to make mention of that for the keep the running guy going. Uh, but at any rate, we're going to talk meeting engagements tonight. And the reason we have Steve here is because Steve thousand point forces. Now we're, we're right in your wheelhouse here. How many, yeah. this, is, this is, this is, this is well explored space at the holy events. Yeah, it is. It's definitely, definitely something that, piqued my interest when this was when we first heard about it so yeah it's definitely um something that um that we'll talk about more after we get through all the first pre-show stuff <laughs> yes exactly uh so we'll we'll get into it talk about some of the, the our own past experiences with this because i agree i was super excited about this the moment i heard about it and uh i still think it's interesting but i think we have some some varied opinions on it so we'll we'll talk it through uh, at any rate, uh, let's start with the non-news, because there is just no news this week. There is a rumor engine. Would you like to see it? It's kind of yeah. interesting, actually. Let's do the rumor engine. Yeah. Let's take a look. I, this one's I, actually... This will be the first time I've seen it, so... Okay, this I'm one's excited. kind I'm of excited. interesting. So, here we go. It's, like, clearly a, a little bandy, strappy thing, right, with a gem. Okay, yep. cool. Yep. The gem looks... Mm -hmm. This is a fairly common design, but it's a little elvish yep. in this like little rappy mm -hmm. thing here. Yep. This looks a bit like some kind of mount or something like that, right? Like yep. uh like a mane. Yeah, yep. yeah, kind of like a mane. So mm -hmm. this is kind of interesting. This gives us so mm -hmm. this is better. What are the scale quality things at the top? Right, yeah. This right here, you mean? I yeah. think that's just more mane blowing over from the wind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I agree. I think it's just chunky hair blowing, but yeah, I agree. It could be something thing. else. Mm -hmm. Like It's always good to flip your head around and make sure you're looking at it at the right angle, but the hair hanging down in this way tells me we're looking at it right side up, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Angel elves. Yeah, sure. Oh, that's a, that's I mean, a good call. I mean, but what, like, what mounts are they riding? They have lions. 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 Really uh, cool. You're lion. Not gonna argue with lions, like lion, yeah. lion pegasi. Yep, flying, flying lion. lion. Yep, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah. It'll be like everything a flying. Will, everything will fly. Everything doesn't it kind of feel that way right now? Mm -hmm. Like the weird, like you know, everything has wings, like the Toralong. I don't know. I just yeah. Okay. You mean the angry sure. donkey? Yeah, with the silly head. Yeah. Yeah, lions with wings. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, so. I'm I'm down with that. I no, I mean we all know the angel elves. The the it is the army of tomorrow and always will be. It's been the rumor yeah. for persistently for two years. Uh, we all we all await it. Given the the little tease we got back in you know whatever book it came in right where they talked yeah. about Tyrion's yeah. angelic forces or whatever up in, in high. So I so don't care. <laughs> I. <laughs> I so do. <laughs> Bring well, me uh, my angel. Have them. Have your frilly little elves. Bring yeah. me my I'm angel. Done. I'm done. I'm done with elves. I, yeah. Okay. I'm I'm super on board with them. If yeah, you are. If, if they look actually like angels, like I would want them to look, just go for the classical look. Just take all the best angel art from Magic cards. And turn those into Warhammer models. Oh, I'll buy the Lord. army. No. I'll buy the whole army. I'll buy seven no. of them. 
No. I will buy all of them. You can't oh, see it right now, but I guarantee you, if I just like, if I minimized to desktop right now, it's it would true. be some picture of a Magic Card Angel because it's just a rotating nah, series of twenty nah. different Magic Card Angels on all my screens. That is a true statement of Vince's desktops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all of them okay. surrounding me. Wow. A chroma watches over me right now from the side at all times. Have fun with that. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, some okay. kind of horsey mount thing. It could be that. Could also be, I'm surprised, Tom, you didn't go for Swift Hawk, the official new Swift Hawk expansion, that that's why they stuck around uh, because they're getting expanded. No, I just, I like, I've given up on the Swift Hawk. Like, you know, like that said, I'll, let me say this GW almost has to release Swift Hawk now because mm -hmm. it's been such a running joke and they've thumbed their nose at like all of the running jokes. Giants before Swift Hawks. Uh, maybe, maybe. Um, but. Uh, I mean, I think that there may be a future in Swift Hogs. I well, it could be time will tell. You know, there was a push online today, started by I, I believe Rob, the Honest War Gamer, who was talking about how how is there not a giant faction book? And I was like, yes. I'm glad to see other people are finally get on on board for this. For this, like, yes, let's get that going. It'd be I so saw easy. That too. That's why I it's, said giants before Swift Hog. Yeah, like I would. That's I that is Rob. Slam dunk, print the book. It's the Imperial Knights Codex of of uh, of Age of Sigmar. You just have the rules to make some giants better giants, like bigger giants and character giants. Do right. you know where you go with this? Maybe. This is your first gold faction. Sure. Um, and it's, it can be either chaos or destruction. Sure. Yep. Fine. Yeah. And Super then Joe Fletch, Joe Fletch can bring his whole giant army to a holy event and be very happy. I would also accept it, like, if you really want to blow me away, make a new giant kit, too. Like, give me, so there's two giants. Yeah, that'd be kind of cool. Like, and this one an should angel, be An angel bigger. giant, Vince? I would be oh, super fine giant? with that. I'm super fine with that. But, a uh, giant with wings? Of course. <laughs> no. Flying giant. A giant giants. with pets. Yeah. Like a, dogs. I would like to see a bigger giant, or a different take on a giant, right? The, the, as opposed to just the drunken oaf. Like, it'd be neat to have more of, like, a hunter-type giant, or a frosty-type giant, something like that, you know? Something more Viking or Frost looking giant. or something like that. Cool. Yeah, that would be super Frost cool, giant. right? Just a because that yeah. would be a very different take than uh, than the existing kind of oafy, you know, English little skinny could, armed giant. If they align with uh, Iron Jaws, I'm all in. I, frozen giants with the Iron Jaws of the North. Woohoo! Yeah, like, I think that'd way. be a that'd be a nice be a nice theme. I mean, yeah. you know, as we've said many times, like D and D is ripe with all these giant types. There's a thousand types of giants in D and D. It's a rich and replete thing. Uh, you got giant craft and against the giants and a hundred other giant related things. And they're all fun and good. Just, just rip off some of that. It's fine. Like it's cool. You just got them ripping off. You got them ripping off from D and D. You got them ripping off from magic. Yeah. Good yeah. designers borrow. Great designers steal. steal. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. True. exactly right. Uh, so that's my, you know, whatever, make it happen. Okay. Uh, so giants aside, which is probably not happening, uh, but they are doing another Knights Codex, which is great. I'm excited for that new, no, nothing to related to AOS, but I'm excited for that new Chaos Knight kit that's coming out. So super cool. If you like Knights, like I do, Chaos Knights look pretty cool. Well, you just have more robots that you can paint. Like you I have do. I hired an uh, additional army you can start. I have a Slanesh Knight force planned already. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to work on slowly over the next, now that my sister's force is basically done, I'll work on the Slanesh force over the next three years. Of course you will. Yeah, the Knights thing, uh, that I, as some people who follow me on Twitter will know I've been dabbling in 40K. And um, I kind of, I'm, I'm in on Death Watch. And um, I was between, it was between Death Watch and Knights. So, um, yeah, the, the whole Knights thing is kind of intriguing. Didn't you say you weren't going to start? You chose wrong. I did. I did. I did. I did say that, Tom. And, and Vince, no, I didn't because <laughs> Death Watch is so awesome for conversions and it 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 it, it actually mm -hmm. absolutely just no you're right knights are it, very stock it, it, it touches me exactly where i want to be because i can take i was never able to place in my old 40k days i was never able to really settle in on a on one specific space marines chapter mm -hmm. so and with death watch i can have his i can have sure, them you all. get your you get your pick of the litter yes of absolutely course. absolutely sure so anyway but we're not right. talking 40k. Let's we're not, on. but that's just quick asides. All right. That's basically all the news. There's nothing else going on. Like as <laughs> far as as far as news go. Uh, hopefully yep. in this next weekend we will uh we'll get the FAQ 
So hopefully next week that will be a big coming. call. Like it's around the corner. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like we're yeah. building. It's this is the calm before the storm. Like we're gonna be you. About and then cry. the war cry build up will talk. Yeah, because the war cry is gonna launch on seven twenty, whatever that Saturday yeah. is. Yep. So, so in this area of war cry, like, do they not understand boots or foot coverings? Like, why, why are, why is everybody barefoot? Why are all the models barefoot? They're barbarians. <laughs> because oh, come the, on. the floor is lava. It's that's crap. That's total floor, crap. They're the floor is lava, and it doesn't matter if they have oh, boots on. on. If the yes, floor is does. lava, it doesn't matter if they have boots on. Oh, come on, <laughs> dude. My marauders don't aren't running around and without boots come on uh, yeah i i can't answer the question uh one other event note i want to make here though as we leave this section behind uh obviously yes in the next coming weeks we'll see a lot because they'll they'll spin up the war cry coverage probably next week right once the the chaos knights codex comes out uh call to war baby can con 2020 january 25th and 26th in australia everything's up i'll link to the tournament so you can go see that stuff uh it's gonna be big i think uh i think the the reasonable goal this year is 660 players so you know pretty reasonable i think we can make it happen so good luck good luck australia we're all behind you the road to 600 begins now that's what i say all right so uh gentlemen let's talk about some pick of the week steve you uh you got some stuff to share what would you like to share with share with everybody yeah um, ex profundus. I don't know if anybody's really familiar with that blog. Um, but it's really cool. It's a AOS 28 competition ex profundus. They've got a website. Um, Vince will share it below, but it's this really kind of dark and horror kind of based age of Sigmar or, War or 40 K any kind of Warhammer really. Um, and, uh, they have some really great stuff on there. Um, I, um, I had known about the blog before, um, before, uh, a while, a while ago, but then I, I was doing a one-on-one -on -one hobby coaching session with, uh, Jake LaClore and, um, he was talking about, about their, um, their site and the, um, specifically he was talking about the elves of the black sloth hell and, uh, wanted some, some feedback on maybe how he could replicate some of those techniques. And um, I spent a lot of time after getting off the Skype call with Jake, just going through there and, and, and looking at the site and really taking it in. And I really enjoy everything that's on there. And admittedly, it's horror and it's gritty. And it's, you know, it's, it's kind of where I started when I started in this hobby. I was very gritty with everything. And I've kind of progressed to uh, clean. But it, it really jumped out at me. And I wanted to share it with, the, with, the, with, the, uh, with your viewers. And then my second one is an honorable mention. He's a fellow Neo who uh, is out there on Twitter. And if you're not following him, you should be following him. His name is Steve Foote. Um, and Steve is doing this amazing warp wheel, um, <laughs> yeah. which is just mind-blowingly cool. And yep. if you're not following it, I will not even – I mean, it's massive. It's probably – it's got to be the size of, you know, bigger than a ba basketball. Um, it's just phenomenally cool. And um, the what he's Steve done with the project – yeah, large beach ball. Good, good, good call, Tom. And yeah. then what he did was he did an illustration of this like large warp wheel, and it's pinned to his um, it's pinned to his Twitter feed, so you can see his illustration. And then I believe he got Dark Mills Fantasy. Is yep. that right, Tom? Dark yeah, very easy though. I it's a great Garisimo. segue into my uh, into my segment. But yes, go ahead. So he got he got he worked with him to print three D print his his design of this warp wheel and man wow. it is mind-blowingly cool and the one thing i looked at it when i first thought about it i said talk about an awesome display board maybe he used that as a display board at, a, at an event um it's just so awesome so uh, you should check it out and he's got stuff up there on on twitter um of his progress throughout the project and it's just absolutely mind-blowing and and steve's a, a hobby hero and uh he's also i think he's involved yeah he's definitely involved with raw Yep. Um, so you should definitely be following him. If you're not, um, you're missing out. Nice. Yeah. That's it. So some of the story behind that, uh, he reached out to dark fantastic, uh, mills, uh, the company was on Twitter, uh, to actually do, um, like to design it. Um, like he had drawn up the stuff and he's like, mm -hmm. Hey, can you like, you know, print all this stuff. yeah. Well, yeah. Like, can you like digitally sculpt this and then print it for me? And the answer was yes. And it's yeah, going to be an amazing project. Um, which leads me into my um, 
my or my my uh, pick of the week, um, which is a YouTube channel actually. Um, it is uh, called. Where did it go? Never heard of them. What's a YouTube channel? Uh, weird, <laughs> weird YouTube channel. I just sent this to you. There it is. You did. Um, it is uh, teaching so tech. Like, wondering what. Sorry. And it is, um, it's like a channel for uh, tips, tutorials, and reviews for 3D modeling, 3D printing, laser cutting, all of the like, like ancillary stuff that we're doing in the hobby. You know, like if you want to really kind of push some of your like creation, uh, you know, like creativity in a new direction, uh, this is definitely one way to do it. Um, I was put onto this channel uh, by uh, Anthony Paul Castro, a friend of the show. He's the one that got me into 3D printing. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that's a big uh, kind of um, what I want to point out on this channel is a bunch of the Ender 3 videos. The Ender 3 is a, um, a 3D printer that is around 200 and probably 50 bucks. Um, so it's a fairly, ch uh, it's on the, the cheaper end. And yet it, the quality of print jobs that it can put out are are um, competing with some of the top stuff. Um, so it's a very low end printer, like low price point printer, let me say it that way, that that can do very good quality. Um, the print bed is a little bit smaller than like what I have, but it's still more than sufficient to do most terrain pieces. Um, and so, and they have a bunch of very fantastic uh, tutorials for the Ender 3. So the Ender 3 is a great like starter printer for anybody that might be interested in that. And this channel has kind of all the tips and tricks and and stuff around the under three and getting started. So I would highly encourage y'all to, to check it out if 3D printing has been something that's kind of grabbed your attention. It's courted me for uh, a number of years and then I finally pulled the trigger on it and I haven't looked back. And that thing has never not been moving while we've been shooting. Like it literally, you've been printing every time we've ever done an episode. Yep. I always check. Yep. Like I was watching, you can see the little wheel move yep. top every so often. So that's, that's all I look at, yes. Uh, right on. Uh, for my pick of the week, uh, it segues into my hobby time, but I'll share the pick. Um, so the my pick of the week is for uh, a Twitch stream, which is Sam Lenz's Twitch stream, mm -hmm. uh, which we did. He and I did like a four hour stream this last weekend. Uh, if you're not, if you're on Twitch, if you like Twitch, if you like watching hobby on Twitch, you should watch Sam. He's a lot of fun. Uh, he let me hang out with him while he did his weekly stream last Saturday while we were painting a uh, giant warlord night titan plates for four hours that was four hours out of the many many more hours we were working on them and uh so that was a lot of fun and go check that out uh and then side note if you like sam i know he's doing a big i wanted to say and you're gonna be at nova he is teaching a big giant uh two and a half day thing beforehand you should check out as well he's got an upcoming class in philadelphia so for all my philly students who were there, who were in that area, uh, around Gamers Haven, Phoenixville. Uh, Sam is coming there to do the large monster class at the end of July. Uh, so if you're interested and you want to learn from one of the best artists in the United States today, uh, that would certainly be an awesome thing to do. So check it out. I'll put links down to Sam's stuff uh, down there. Great dude, and it was a lot of fun hanging out with him this weekend. So I'll just slide right into hobby time, which that was a lot of my hobby time which was driving to Wisconsin or whatever <laughs> to hang out and work on that Warlord Titan. The thing is bigger than I, like, you know how we always talk about Tom, the joke of like, you know, the desert top, but you don't know how hot the desert is till you walk in it without yeah. water, you know, yeah. like, you know, I know the Warlord Titan is big, but until you actually like have all the plates in your hand and you're working on this thing, it's, it's hard to rationalize. Like it's so stupidly massive and it comes across in like, the number of uh of like the oh am i dropping are you guys is it normal for you like am i clipping out at all you're, for either of you you are clipping a little bit not for me you sound okay for me okay weird uh i don't know what's going on but i'll figure it out um at any rate uh so i spent all weekend working on that and am i coming through okay now with everything yeah. yes yep. okay all right, so hopefully it's all right. If not, I apologize, people. I'll figure it out when I pass it over to Tom. Uh, but I've spent, since I got back, I've been working on a whole bunch of different hobby stuff, uh, including uh, I've been working on these little dudes here. And the reason I'm working on these little guys 
is because these are all what I'm painting for the uh, big giant contrast video that's going up this weekend. So the the all things contrast guide is going up this weekend. I spent a bunch of bunch of time refining stuff and uh, experimenting over this week since I got back and then recorded a big giant video trying to unpack everything I could think of to do with these paints and how you can use them. So that video will be coming this weekend. So there you go. And then I want to finish up my big project and hopefully have that done by next week. All right. Steve, what about you, man? You're on a long hobby streak. <laughs> yeah. 206 consecutive days. Um, yeah. Uh, more work on Iron Jaws of the North. Um, got a lot base coated uh, this week. All these boys right nice. here. Um, so these are all base coated with their the first layer of armor. And now I'm doing the refinement. So I'm working on the individual ones to get them uh, tighter. Uh, really calling out the um, the ice texture in the armor and the patterns. Um, so having a lot of fun with that. Finally starting to feel like I'm making some progress there. And then I'm also uh, doing uh, my Death Watch distraction. I was able to, um, this week, that's right over my shoulder, right back there. Pick the other side, right there. Uh, that's all my Death Watch guys. Um, they're all uh, converted up. I took all of my um, Primaris Marines that I had from, um, help me out, what was that last starter kit with the Nurgle? Uh, oh, Nurgle. Are you talking about oh, the, the Nurgle one? Yeah. Yeah, I, to tra I had took the, the Primaris half, and then what I did was I butchered all of them up and put on Forge World uh, MK3 um, armor shoulder pads to give them more of that veteran look. Um, and uh, they look pretty cool. Did some good, nice little conversions there. I still have some work to do there, but um, I just recently joined a 40K Gentleman's League out here in the Illinois area, which is which is kind of cool. So it's, it's motivating. I'm glad to finally put those models to use. And um, But for the most part, the hobby's been really focused on Iron Jaws. And then I've got two tables that I'm working on for Holy Havoc slash Holy Wars. So one is the Brass Fortress, and then the other is a... Well, I'm going to keep that to myself for now. Okay. So Lots of nice. stuff. Tom, what about you, buddy? Um, I have been doing a lot of building. I'm in a building phase right now. Probably because I just don't want to paint uh, Hearthguard Berserkers anymore. Um, yeah, they're uh, they're almost done, the Hearthguard are. so. But I... I've taken a detour. I've been working on Iron Jaws this week. Got my kids' stuff all put together. Everything's based. Uh, we've gotten a game in this week, which is fantastic. Um, uh, and then uh, I have been working on today. Uh, I probably won't use these. I realized, like, I need to get... Like, I had ordered all the bits, and I had the bits, like, all piled up on my table. And I was like, I'm going to start on these today. And, like, as I'm putting these together, I'm realizing that, like, this is the absolute wrong time to be doing this. Because I was putting together my conversion, like, compilation of stuff, of mercenary, like, my FEC mercenaries for my dwarves. Um, and I'm doing them all as robots. Um, and so, like, the full automaton, like, undead. So, instead of doing undead for the dwarves, I'm doing, like, full-on robots. Um, like, a like where, like, the mad scientist amongst the, 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 amongst my clan, like, in the lore... Like, the farthest we had went was, like, a Luminar and dabbling with magic. Um, and now, like, there's one that's went off the the deep end, and so he's going to be my arch regent, and he's going to be, like, the, tr the true mad scientist, and I've been kitbashing a bunch of of uh, of dwarves, and I got the first couple done, and so here we go. Um, here's the first one. <laughs> tau head? Is that a Tau head? It is a Tau head. Uh, yeah. It's a perfect robot head. Um, yeah, on, yeah, on like a mechanical cool. dwarf body, and I'm using like arms from the, uh, um, from the Sakaran stuff, and I'm doing yeah, those. Are, those are good robot arms. I like that robot arm. Yeah, yep. that works. And so I need they need to look mean, like mean, clawy, undead, because they're representing ghouls. And so, um, and so I did these. I have twenty of these that I'm working on right now, and it's a lot of like cutting bits and repositioning because those hands, like I've had to like a bunch of them, or most of them are all for the left arm, and so I've had to like cut and reposition a bunch of the joints to make it look like it's going the right way, even though it's definitely not. 
Um, but it's been a fun project. And like, I wanted the weapons, I wanted the picks from the fire slayers to bring that aesthetic through, you know, to be consistent with that. And I didn't want to confuse these with any of my, um, my Arcanaut company. Mm -hmm, um, sure. so, and so like, I needed the weapons to be different. I needed their profile to be different and I'm, I'm going to do some coloration differences too. So it'll be fun. Um, I'm looking right now for what my flares and my crypt flares and crypt tours are going to be. Um, so I, I get a lot of play if I'm doing 50 millimeter base robots. Um, and so I'm like, I'm already brainstorming. I'm looking at a couple different companies. I'm looking at some Forge World stuff. Um, but the, the big challenge is getting the head right. Um, and I have some ideas on, on how to do that for these dwarf robots. So anyways, so that's what I'm working on. Just kind of a fun project. I don't know if I'm actually going to take them to any events or not, but um, I wanted to build them because I, they were in my head and I needed to get them out there. Well, I, it is a great robot head. I apologize if I actually let robot slip out. I, sometimes I, my brain is, you know, goes in the fritz. <laughs> Hopefully my, my connection should be okay now. Am I, am I clear and coming through all right now yeah. to both of you? Yeah. I realized yeah. my computer was running a background processing task on the video. I was preparing for the contrast thing. And so I suspect it wasn't my internet. It was just my computer chugging through video editing. Awesome. So I, I stopped that. I thought it was done before the show, but it wasn't. So I apologize, everyone. Uh, at any rate, um, yeah, good. You know, I'll tell you playing around with this contrast stuff, just as a slight aside, it's been a nice fun project. It's funny. I would have liked these so much more when, before, like I started painting in a different style because yeah. they're much more like what I used to, the style I used to paint in. Yeah. And yeah. I still like them quite a bit. They're fun to play around with. Um, but the, uh, I decided for some God awful reason to do this entire unit in non-metallic metal, just like I'll do all this armor in NMM. Why not? It'll be all, it'll all, you know, you got to put in the reps, right? That's it. You got to put in the reps. So I'm like seven into this Vestigor unit and I want to kill myself. I just want that to be known. <laughs> uh, so at you any know rate, what the answer to that is? I'm ready. Don't do NMM. That's no, the right I mean, answer. it's good practice. Like it's just, it's good practice to play with the light and stuff. And on a unit, I don't really care about. It's just, I don't really care about this unit. I was using them for a tutorial, but now I'm like, well, sunk cost fallacy is a go. We got to finish this thing. So now I just got to like put on my karate kid music and just be like, you know, best. <laughs> you know, and just like, that's going to be the, that's going to be the, the goal to keep going. Waste of time. Uh, look, it's necessary. You don't, you don't just, you don't have anything. You got to you got a full, you got a full, you full in. You're all in. Well, he's not go hard saying the that that's the waste of time. He's saying that, and then not metallic metal. Yeah, just right. doing an MM doing in it. general is a waste of time. That's my. That's I used nonsense. to do it. I used to do it uh, when I was playing Lord of the Rings. Sure. Um, I did all my everything. I did was was non metallic metal. But then I just I don't know. It was um. <laughs> here you go. You know who changed my mind on that? Ben Johnson. Uh, okay. When he was on Bad Dice podcast, they were talking about it one time. Yeah. And uh, I remember Ben in his dry way, just like. No, I just open it up out of the pot and I just put it on and it's done. Why would I do that? <laughs> so sure. I thought to myself, yeah, what the hell? Why am I doing this? Like, I mean, yeah, it's cool. But it's like, really? I Do I really want to do this? And I mean, I get what you're saying, Vince, with the whole lights and shade, you know, the shading and the yeah. progression. And the whole it thing. forces you to think there's, things through. There's it's good other practice ways to, to do it every time. Yeah. I do that like with these iron jaws. That's what I'm doing with these iron jaws, with the ice armor is creating depth and, and through, through this, it's a very similar technique. Uh, like doing um, non-metallic metal, but yeah, I, I'm kind of beyond No, I, it's fun too. It was interesting because I wanted to play around with mixing these paints in with right. other normal paints. And you'll see it in the video because in the video, I actually explore how I do, how I, I was sort of working in MM. And I will say this, like this one, this space wolves gray yeah. uh, is actually really good for that sort of effect. It's really nice. It's the only thing space wolves have ever been good for ever. Um, but oh, the... Tongue. Uh, but the, uh, it, it's a really interesting color for that sort of thing. I also find it fascinating. The great difference in these paints, like some of them are so intense and strong and bright. And some of them are like so weak and, and just like barely produce any effect. It's fascinating. The difference between them. Let me introduce you to blood angels. Red. Yeah. I mean like the, <laughs> yeah, like this flesh terrors, red, the dark angels green, the, the Akeli ain't green as I've taken to calling it this one. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, cause it, cause it's blue. You see, that's the, 
that's the pun there. Um, and then the Griffhound orange, which this one I really like too. It's a really nice, really unusually unusual orange that I really like. Anyway, did you find a, you find a substitute for Waywatcher and for um, Gilliam Blue, the glazes? Did you find anything you think would be a good substitute? Uh, I mean, I don't have the whole range. I have, I bought like a good okay. selection of every color of what I knew was the yeah. stronger okay. colors. So I could just mix. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure you could thin down the, like the dark angels and get a good green. Um, mm -hmm. but it's not exactly the same thing. There's a, there's a I, couple I'm just curious things. for the community. That's all. I mean, yeah, I sure. No, it's a good question. I, I don't, I don't use that stuff. So I just was wondering if there was, if anybody has discovered a substitute for those. Sure. Um, the, yeah, I mean the, there's the 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 colors are interesting and whatever i don't want to get into the whole review watch the whole review coming this or not <laughs> review sorry watch the whole tutorial coming this weekend and you can hear all of my opinions in a very very long video uh all right so that will be appropriately bookmarked throughout with like little links down in the description so you can skip to the sections you care about um at any rate there's a lot of misnamed colors in here that's what i'll say this is not white i don't know in what universe this apothecary white, they decided to slap the word white on here, but I would have accepted apothecary gray. That would have been perfectly fine. Nice try. No, you, you put that down and then you do a layer of white highlights and then you have white. I, I, I understand what the concept is. I, I get the idea. You don't name paints for stuff not in the bottle. Right. Okay. I'm just saying it ain't white. Uh, at any rate, it's fine though. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, interesting little little pot of paint that i had to put agitators in because it separates so hard and so fast like my <laughs> god this stuff <laughs> at any rate not what we're here to talk about what we're here to talk about is meeting engagements so let's uh all right my paintbrush away focus let's get into it that's right it's time to focus up so let's start at the beginning let's let's give our our overall kind of forty thousand foot view what do we think how do we feel <laughs> um I, I don't want to color the conversation uh, okay. just yet. Like I, I, I have my opinions, but I'd rather, I'd rather let you guys say first. So like Steve, you're the guest. What is okay. your, what were you excited about with these? I guess is my question and why and how well do you feel it delivered? I'm still, um, I, I'm still on the, I'm still on the fence with how it delivered. Okay. So I'm not going to address that because I don't know. Um, my first take, and the reason I don't know is because I haven't had time to really play a game and really give it, and I will this weekend because we have club day on Saturday. Um, and my plan is to play, play it a lot on Saturday. Um, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to really comment on how it delivered because I don't think that would be fair. Um, but what I will say is that I, I like a lot of what's in here. Mm -hmm. I think it has, I think it has great potential. Um, and when I say that, um, you know, we do our little Intel mission at Holy Havoc, which, yep. which is kind of like a meeting engagements, um, type of setup. So when I first heard that this was coming, I was super, super stoked. Um, I am a fan of smaller games. I really enjoy them. Um, and, uh, the idea that they invested time and energy to give us a, um, a, a new um, way to play the game that has some thought behind it. Um, I'm very happy about that. Um, I'm not sure that they got it right. We were talking before the show about some of the balancing issues that are probably existent here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, especially with the, um, you know, what units you can take, um, how things break down. Um, you know, that's a bit of a concern, you know, because you, you could have hero hammer um, going on. Um, and that's not necessarily going to be fun for anybody. Um, but I think that there is huge potential and I'm excited about it. And I like what I've seen and so far and what I've read. Um, I think I'll stop babbling now and let Tom, Tom have his say. Tom, what's your thoughts? Um, I was hopeful. Um, I'm interested and excited for the um the challenge the list building challenge that it presents uh, in concept uh, but what i will say is that in practice when you put your models on the table and you you know begin to deploy and smash them forward um it uh it 
what it what it exacerbates, what it makes worse, is some of the inequities, particularly with regard to mobility. Mm -hmm. um, you feel it more than almost any other game format, and part of that's because of deployment, which we're going to talk about. Yep. Um, it. I mean, the one. It doesn't help that two days ago I played a meeting engagements where both armies, the default movement for both armies was four inches. <laughs> <laughs> hey! hey. Like I watched my son Are we gonna like, fight today. Spend multiple command points to get his iron jaws across the table so they could punch something. Sure, like that, like just just so they could move an extra four inches. You know, like mm -hmm. just so they could get a couple inches out. The pigs in combat way before everything else. Oh yeah, like, you know, like it was a real big issue before. for him because I was like, yeah, we're having pork. You know, like, sure. because all my stuff could get into the pigs. Um, so it, there's just some real practical concerns. I think it's going to create the haves and have nots. And I think that if this becomes a actual format where people want it to be competitive, it will be skewed much harder than the standard meta. And what I mean by that is that the meta will not be as diverse. It will be a handful of armies that have good mobility, that have good options, and that have strong punch. That's yeah. So I, I agree kind of with all of that. Like, I, I think my ultimate uh, take on it would be this. And, and you know, I think um, Cinderfall said this in the in the comments at some point. But like the problem here is in the execution. Right. Like this is a really good idea. There's a lot of good ideas on display here, I will say. Right. OK, which we're going to get into. I actually think there's a lot of really smart, clever ideas on here. Some things that I think could come in back into match play. We'll talk about that when we get to stuff like scenarios. Um, like in a standard 2K match play, whatever we want to call it. I don't know what we want to call it now. Regular games, I don't know. Um, Basically, this entire format, by the way, is that uh, that old... Uh, um, the old one match play scenario that nobody liked. Um, like with the staggered deployment. Oh, sure, um, yeah. The, the old escalation or whatever. Escalation, yeah. yeah like the yeah. whole format is escalation. But like, but like real stretched yeah. out. Yeah. Um, yeah, like there, there's just, this is a good first try. Like good first try. Well done here. I have, I have some notes. Let's go back. <laughs> sure. And let's fix that. You know, and, but that's okay because here's the thing. This is sort of the first shot at this. I think it is totally different and will always be totally different. Yeah. I would never expect the meta of this to be the same as what a 2K game looked like or like what's good in this to be exactly the same as what's good in a 2K game. Of course. And I don't, and I don't think that's bad. And I don't right? think it should be. My concern is that it's a very narrow field. Right, exactly. Is that it's too off kilter. And that's ultimately right. what I agree with. Different isn't bad, right? right. Necessarily. Right. But you can be different in the wrong ways and that can be bad, right? Like... Different is a big circle. Bad is a smaller circle inside. We don't want to drift into that. And we're, we're definitely somewhere hanging out near it. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. So let's just go through and get into the, the nitty and the gritty, shall we? <clears throat> All right. So meeting engagements. Here we go. Sorry, I've got to get my book out here. And... Uh, which, by the way, I agree with everybody else who got the Warlord who said it should have come with eight tokens. It didn't. It only comes with six objective yeah, markers. Yeah. And I'm like, man, I got to pull two out of something else. But anyway, I get it. All the objective markers. The worst is that, for, by the way, like that token set that you had me buy you for um, oh, Warhammer. Six. Yeah, I don't care. I'm still, just, well, the I'm still stoked about it. The other two will be like a quarter and a dime. That's what you get. <laughs> I don't know why they didn't like label the sleeves for the cards. Oh, like, seriously, that's, yeah, that, How that's is that? so funny you said that, because I opened it up and I was like, wait, which one is this? I had to pull out right. the little cards and look, yes. yeah. and I was going to, oh, I was yeah. going to literally get like one of those little punchy, you know, yeah. writing typey yeah. machine thingies right. and just like, like one of those little pity bows things and, and write what, little things. And what's even them. worse is like, it's in black. So it's like, you can't yeah. really like, can't you just know, pen on I'm gonna, them. yeah, I'm going to have to pen some metallic ink pens on it. Yeah. yeah. Like, what the hell? Anyway. All right. So sorry. Um, yes. No, complaining about Warlord stuff. Uh, at any rate, just the funniest of things. Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? Uh, right? no, what we I do. That's the problem. We, we care about that little piddly shit. Kudos yeah, to it, them. None right. of it actually matters. I just laughed. I was like, that's very funny. I don't honestly care. Kudos uh, to them. 
there were more like war like the offerings in warlord cards this year right. like before it was like one or two decks now yeah. it's like oh man there's just like decks everything. falling out everywhere for everything oh, yeah. i was like, like oh my the, god what are all these the terrain cards? like full of the yeah. terrain suggestion the terrain yeah yeah that was cool cards. i like the little terrain setup yeah. thing map yeah, yeah was cool. that was unexpected i didn't I didn't expect that. That's honestly was, kind of a neat thing I could see like, using in your basement to just like you would you would take that deck, shuffle it, flip it, and then set the terrain in that order. Like sure. that'd be a fun way. Yeah. yeah. To just set up for a game. All right. Meeting engagements. Here we go. Not this isn't like Warlord Edition <laughs> chat for us in the, the, the sorry. I'm sorry. I'm whatever. Sorry. No, it's fine. All right. <laughs> Stay on target. Stay on target. Begin at the beginning. Okay. Picking your army, it's a thousand points. We all get that, right? Cool. Yeah. Moving on. However, there are some differences. Namely, that your army is divided into three categories, spearhead, main body, and rear guard. Despite those names, they do not always appear in that order depending on the scenario, okay? Mm -hmm. Notably, you must have at least one unit in every yep. silo. You must have at least one unit in spearhead, one unit in main body, and one unit in rear guard. Okay. And the spearhead doesn't actually have any hard requirements, right? Like that is say it's all zero to whatever. Right. Some are just zero period. Right. Like you can't have behemoths or artillery in the spearhead, right. but you can have anything else. So like you could have uh, any, you know, like any sort of unit that is a leader or a battle line or an other unit right. in there. Yep. Uh, the main body has a requirement of one plus battle line and one leader. Other than that, it's kind of whatever. This one allows for a, the main body allows for a single behemoth. And then the rear guard again has no hard requirements, but finally allows for the artillery to show up in zero to two and allows for your other behemoth. If you look at this, if you actually like just kind of squish this together, mm -hmm. right? Yep. What you get is effectively like the thousand point sort of matched play as far as behemoths and artillery uh and leaders because you get to a cap of four the difference is you actually only need one battle line over the whole thing right right mm -hmm. so it's um it's a little bit less requirement heavy in total but obviously more so in that you've got to spread out right so at minimum here you would have to have four units yep that is the hard minimum for your army because you have to have a leader and a battle line that can appear in the main body because it requires two. And then you have to have one in spearhead and rear guard. Yep. Right. Okay. Cool. <clears throat> Other interesting restrictions that I thought were, that I thought are worth mentioning here. And then I want to get some of your thoughts on, on sort of how this stuff impacts army construction. Let's just lay this down. One, you can only have one ally, right? One allied unit. Mm hmm no matter what your other other things may be, one allied unit. Um, your unit sizes are all set to the minimum, right? Yep. Unless they are a battle line in main body yep. or anything in the rear guard. In the main, and then in which case they can be 2X, whatever the minimum is, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll take liberators, the classic example. If liberators are cut and battle line could show up in any of the three, if Libby's are showing up in your spearhead, they're five. If they're showing up in your main body, they could be five or 10. And if they're showing up in your rear guard, they could be five or 10. Okay. All right. Uh, you can only have one battalion, which is always tricky at a thousand points anyways, but all right. You can't have more than two of any single war scroll, two units of any single war scroll, unless right. it's in a battalion. Yeah, like you I could have three if they're all packed into a battalion. Yeah, I don't like that. And you can only have one endless spell. And just like regular matched play now, you can only purchase one command point. Yep. Okay. So that is all our restrictions. That's effectively your army construction restrictions, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. So what does this mean? This means like by nature, you're not going to squeeze a big giant horde in. Right. 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 Um, it means that your, uh, your units are going to tend to be on the smaller side. It's going to do things like, uh, 
favor other units if you're splashing in because you only actually need one battle line over the course of the whole thing. So you actually have a lot more freedom to pick what would traditionally be other units. Yep. Right. Yep. Um, yeah. What else? I mean, what? And then there's a, there's a, all that stuff seems good. Like, okay, fine. I can only have one thing allies. Eh, it's fine. Even on the standard match play at 200 points, that was usually the case. Um, killing out big hordes. I get it. That's fair enough. Like, you know, nobody wanted to see 30 hearth guard berserker show up or something like that. Right. Um, endless spellathon not happening here seems reasonable enough, I suppose. Uh, but there's a big giant hole here, in my opinion, right? And or, or I'll, I, I, I mentioned for your both of your opinion, the hole here is that there's no sort of cap, and I don't know, we could talk about what this would look like on your sort of leader behemoth thing that can show up in the main in the main body, and uh in the rear guard and, too yeah or in the rear guard and and just be an absolute house right yeah. so this would be like your gristle gore kumquat this would be your velazda right. your ethereal velazda marathi mm -hmm. you know you can pick your your right. your outrageous giant very difficult to remove very killy piece there's a there's a fair number of these big monsters um, that float around and could show up in the main body and be like, be highly impactful to the point where they could fight, depending on what we're talking about, they could fight most of the enemy army on their own. Yeah. Right. 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 Um, and so like, when you realize that the incentive, if you have one of those big things, that's also very mobile, as many of those things I just mentioned are. <laughs> well, it's not just that though. Like, so there's another factor that people aren't considering. And it's that this format does two things. One, it pulls armies apart. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's like it becomes awesome. easier for a big giant monster to capitalize because they don't get kneecapped back by the entire right. force. Right. They don't need yeah. buffs yeah. or that they don't need the like. And right. so like they, you can send them into one of these forces and it will just delete it. Right. It's a bunch of like min sized unit things that can't make the standard impact. Um, and then the other, the other piece of this puzzle is um, oftentimes those monsters have a high mobility. Um, and so they're going to be able to just run from group to group to group where you don't always have that in a bunch of these min sized unit packs, which by the way, are just going to be fed to it each turn. Especially if you have supreme mobility, like I'm thinking about like a, Heaven forbid, uh, I mean, we, since we don't know what's going to happen with the Gristle Gore, you know, general, and he no. is truly the worst case scenario. Well, uh, the just the regular ethereal vampire lord on zombie dragon, sure, uh, sure. Or how about a uh, a Marathi that has uh, um, in uh, uh, Calibron, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, as has been pointed out, by the way, Marathi doesn't have the behemoth keyword when you select her, so she can, right, you know, she can show she up can in be the spearhead. Right. I mean, I, if the spearhead true. deploys first, we'll get into. Yeah. I under yeah. like remember these things, even though the the sort of yeah. arbitrary conception of them is always spearhead, main body, rear guard. The scenarios aren't actually like that. But that, yeah, that doesn't actually always happen. In fact, right. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I it's not doing what we want it to do. If that's the design, does that make sense? That like that's my pushback. Is that whatever they I think they want this to do, it's not actually accomplishing that goal. Um, sure. I think about my 1K uh, list that I took to Adepticon, which is a Calibron daughter's list. It doesn't violate any of these standards. And let me tell you, it's just as effective, if not more effective. Right. Yeah, it's not. There's like, there's that. That is a really glaring hole, <laughs> right? Like the fact that these, and there, there are like, you can pick your poison. I would also point out that like monsters like Marathi, Monsters that kiss the top of like deadliness, yeah. but are, are leaders that without being behemoths. Yeah. Right. Which there is a selection of these in the game as well, where they're like, they're super good, but they don't act and they're big and they're tough and they have a lot of wounds, but they're not like actually behemoths. Yeah. Right. Um, all of those become like a super hot pick. Right. Uh, yeah. And, and if they're also mobile and dangerous, that's there. They, they can rock the juke pretty hard um, because you do still use all of your like standard allegiance stuff, right? Yep. Like all of that is still in play. 
Um, yeah, I mean, to me, that's probably the biggest challenge. I think that there is an inequity of how this affects some armies. So you yeah. think about what that what that min unit thing means, right? Like with Liberators, let's just keep going with that example. Let's let's just talk Stormcast, right? Yep. Your Stormcast units, if you're talking like Libby's or Seki's or something like that, they're showing up in fives or tens, right? Yep. Right. Okay, what do Clan Rats show up in? Or Marauders? 20s. Or? 40s. Right, they're full size. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because because they're one of those weird units that's like only has two settings, right? It's It's got this giant min. Like and Marauders. Then it, it, Marauders, yeah, exactly. Like anything where it's sort of which min, let me just point out, you can take a forty pack of mer mercenary marauders. Yeah, as far as I know, yeah. the mercenaries would still be valid here as your allies, right? You would just sack all the like you'd have to pay the piper in the same way, right. assuming you can fulfill all the requirements of the mercenary unit. Like most, so most of the mercenary units only have one required unit. So, right. okay, like that's fine. Um, the uh the the but the, the so like there is a very there is very much like a not everybody suffers equally thing, right 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 under yeah. that less a much a stronger pick of winners and losers from the, from list building right um the but, by the way you know a big winner in this uh mix up sure night haunt <laughs> okay because all their all their heroes are basically like non behemoth foot people, and uh, their yes. units are scary and 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 what why why yes. why so and you can also deploy in the in the ghost world like so one thing that you don't you don't realize until you've actually played this format is that like your stuff comes in at the end of your turn and so it creates this really weird like bad incentive because what that means is that you're gonna put your stuff on the table, okay. Mm -hmm. At the end of your turn, not at the end of the round. Which right. means that, like, I gave away my turn multiple times in a row so that my stuff wasn't on the table to be right. shot at or charged at the end of my turn since they were going, because I would have to put it out, and then they would get to go. Right. Yep. Um. And so Night Haunt, just, okay, I, I deploy. I deploy in the Underworld at the end of each of your turns. And so you literally just put all your stuff in the underworld and ignore all the deployment shenanigans. Sure. And Everything bring it out. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like every time you deploy, you just deploy null, null deploy and then bring it out wherever you want on the table um, on your next turn. Sure. Yeah. I mean, sure. Like Stormcast, things like that, where you can pull yeah. that trick, which we'll talk about reserves. That seems like a good segue into deployment because yeah. we'll talk more about as we go along about how that sort of army selection will impact stuff. Right. right? Okay, so that brings us to basically like that sort of uh, deployment and those sorts of things. They have another terrain section in here, which we can probably ignore for the most part. <laughs> uh, ironically, gnaw holes do work in meeting engagements because you could be, yeah. you could be within eight of the edge of the field, but more than not within more, whatever three, the three thing. Three, it more like it's only three inches, not six inches. It's not the size of the gnaw hole anyway. Mm -hmm. Let's assume we can ignore it. Um, mm -hmm. Triumphs are still on the table, that kind of stuff. Okay. So, deployment. And this is where we get to... This is where things get weird. Okay? Yep. So, as mentioned, you've split your forces into spear, head, main body, and rear guard. Yep. Let's take the standard format. The standard format okay? Yep. Which means... Start a game where we would normally deploy stuff you set up your spearhead. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. At the end of your turn one, as you pointed out, not the battle round, your turn one. Yep. You bring on your main body. Yep. Mm -hmm. At the end of your, not battle round, your turn two, okay, you bring on the rear guard. Yep. So it's stacked like that. I should state these games and the scenarios are universally four turns. Right, yeah. They are not five rounds, or four, sorry, four four rounds, four battle rounds, not five turns. Right. right. Okay. Now, there's also directions about where they come on. So, like in the standard battlefield, right? Like if this screen yep. you all are watching is the battlefield, 
it might be that like the spearhead comes from here and the main force comes from here and the rear guard comes from here or something right. like that. Right? right. Every scenario has its own little twist on that. The point is they don't all just like walk on together necessarily. Okay. All right. That's all fine. I, I think that is super impactful. I agree with you, Tom. Like it totally plays with whether or not you take the turn, how you capitalize on it, winning it's that very role difficult is to play fire slayers. giving away the turn. Let me just say, like it's sure. super difficult to play fire slayers in this format. Sure. Because let's get to this. And and Steve, I'm curious as to your, your take on this, because this is the part that drives me insane. Let's talk about arrival edge. Oh. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, uh, arrival edge, the way you show up, as I said, everything could be, is going to be marked. Like you're, let's say, let's say for sake of argument, you're deploying the spearhead first and they're coming from this side of the board for everybody watching. Assume this little screen is the, the board. They're coming from right here. Yep. That ah. means this is what I set up at the start of the game, right? Three inches in. So right, the deployment zone. What's my deployment zone? In our in our in our two K match play, we often have like twenty four inches of territory, and we have to set up twelve inches away from enemy territory, or something like that. Or right? nine, yeah, right, right, right. Exactly. In this, your entire army must be set up wholly within. Yeah, that's three <laughs> inches of yeah. the edge of the battlefield they're arriving on. Yep. So like this much <laughs> right right now right. what's notable about three inches and they have a little picture here even showing yeah. this with an ironclad right vince tell us all about three inches yeah. ha, 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 ha. you should okay. really know about that oh geez oh Pete's. all right so the i won't even deign to comment on that. <laughs> so at any rate the uh your whole army has fewer than three inches and the key with this is some very simple math should tell you that's let's call it roughly 75 millimeters, right? It's actually not exactly, but let's just say it is. And that's relevant because many bases are bigger than that. Yep. Right. Say your standard chariot base, which is like much bigger than that by a little more than an inch and change. Uh, the, the maw crusher base, the pie plate base is a nightmare, but every, like every hundred mil or larger circle, Sure. which is, you know, all, all which is many, yeah. many things. Yes. And the answer is, uh, the answer is you're supposed to hang them off the edge of the table. <laughs> yeah. so <ridiculous>. Right. Like <laughs> if, if, if this is the edge well, of the table and you say, and, and my phone is this base, right. And it won't fit wholly within three. I'm supposed to just set it right here well, like it this. Be within your arrival edge and not the right edge of the can't be off the edge like this it can't yeah, be off the edge of the battlefield but it can be off the edge of your <laughs> of your yeah. arrival edge which is off the battlefield correct so it like and and like the i get the understanding like their thought in their head by the way we didn't mention table size they recommend a sort of range of table sizes from like right. basically 30 to 36 the low end of 40 to 48 at the high end yeah. and the obvious answer here is 36 by 48 the reason for that is because if you take a standard six by four foot table and you bisect it, you get two 36 by 48 play areas, right? So like a TO would just be able to walk down the tables and put a, like a piece of tape down or a little ruler or something and bing, bang, boom, every table becomes two. Cool. So, uh, so most T most tournaments I've been to don't yeah. like have the game board and then a couple inches of extra space to make the tables wider. The tables are generally four feet across. Exactly. Right. So that's the battlefield. Yeah. There might be a little space for like vertically. So at some tournaments, the battlefields do not abut each other, but not all of them. So I guess in the vertical deployment ones, lengthwise deployment, I right. would be able to like hang things off the edge, but that is madness. In what universe is this a valid deployment method? Like what? I got nothing. That, that well, is mind-boggling to me. Mind-boggling. Well, I mean, they, by the way, this isn't just like big models. Chaos chariots, which are like, what, 70 points now and meant to be run in units, right? right. Yeah. Every chariot that's now meant to be run in units, great, I'll get a unit of them. They're like 210 points, right, for three chaos chariots. Mm. You're not going to run three chaos chariots. Maximum. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, two. I'll get two of them. 
I'll get two of them. There you go. Thank you. You're absolutely right. I'll get two carry asteroids. 140 points. Thank you, Tom. You're exactly right. Two castrates. Great. That's like two things I now got to sit there and like prop up or whatever. Whatever I'm doing, just asking for it, right? And my point is, it's not like only very expensive models. Most of your army could be composed of models on bases like this quite easily. What? <laughs> yeah, I don't love it. understand I love it. that logic. There, there doesn't seem to be much logic in that decision. Um, you know, when they when they start off the first paragraph telling you that you can play this on your typical dining room table, then I guess, yeah, having it hang off the arrival edge is just fine if you're playing on your dining room table. Um, maybe, I don't know, if you are if you have a really small dining room table, you can play on a smaller surface, and it's not a big deal if it's hanging off the, the, the edge of the battlefield because you might have more table, but like at a tournament, yeah, it's not going to work. And clearly, um, they intend this to be tournaments. They have a they tournament. They have a tournament. They have yeah, a, like know. tournament I, section for running this at it, tournaments. I know. I'm looking at can, it right now. Can, can I can I jump jump in real quick and just identify something? Sure. Can I point out the other ridiculous thing, the other miss here? Sure. You know, like now that we're talking about tournaments, um, how do you determine who goes first? Sure. This is what I was yeah, going to say uh, for scenarios. I was going to say it for scenarios because I was going to, as we walked through the sort of drop instructions, but yes, yes, it's fair enough to mention it now. There's no actual instructions for determining how you go first. <laughs> One would assume you just inherit the AOS the rules of standard, standard like AOS, but that's not. But is that only for the, uh, the like, so is it total number of units across all three things or just what goes down turn one? I assume yeah. just what's deployed. But again, yeah, you're right. Stuff doesn't that get is, deployed yeah. until it turns two, one and two. I understand. No, I assume right. it's what's deployed in the force that you initially, that is your arrival force, right? Your spear, whatever, right. which isn't spear guards, arrival yeah, force, whatever you deploy head. first. Yeah, spearhead. Um, and so, like, I don't know. I mean, again, we can make assumptions. Like, we can make a valid leap and say this is a perfectly reasonable way to do it, but it right. feels like a thing that they shouldn't be silent on, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Because they walk they through. Like, Told us. Yeah, they walk through like once we get to the scenarios, they walk through like determining who's the red team and the blue team because that sometimes matters. And then you go back and you alternate units from this particular force and blah, blah, blah. And then it feels like there's just a sentence that got clipped, <laughs> right? <laughs> Every right. time, like whoever does this first gets to go first. Like, yay. Okay, great. Um, no, you're exactly right, Tom. Um, it, the battlefield thing just trips me off because it's a simple, dumb thing. And by the way, Shout out to Autumn Lotus in the, in the comments who had a completely reasonable solution to this, which is just if you have a model that wouldn't normally fit with a wholly within three inches, you simply must deploy it completely on the board with its base touching the table edge. The back edge. Yeah, the back edge, like your arrival edge, right? Sure. Okay. Sure. Um, great. Like, solved it. Done. <laughs> like, it's... <laughs> Or, or just make like a six inch deployment zone because why am I sticking all my models near the edge of the table where it's really easy to knock them off and break them? I know it sounds stupid, but like how many times have you seen it happen? Yep. Like I fear all the time when my models get near board edges because it's, it's so easy. Now I understand I build things like that. So like it's particularly precarious, but like, you know, just, just give some healthy room there. Like what, why? why it's a shorter game anyways yeah you're just over incentivizing extremely fast armies by by putting it that far apart right like the farther distance you got you you start apart the more you incentivize speed and mobility and teleportation yep. yeah it doesn't make there doesn't there's no logical reason it should just be touch the back edge touch the edge of the board Right. Holy within six would be another good solution. I'd be fine with that because that would fit every every model except the dumb dragon, which is two or the the oh, dragon, God. the dread saurian, and the yeah. um right. the um that guy. Mr. Right. War Mammoth. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> See you knew what I meant. I didn't need to say the word. Language is amazing. All right. So uh, the point being is that like there were so many easy roads to walk down. We chose none of them and we ran through the muddy field instead. So there you go. At any rate.
Uh, because again, I like the concept. Let me say this. Like, again, this is one of those things where like in concept, the splitting up the force and having them arrive in these waves, I actually think is really interesting. Yes. Right. If the, if the, uh, if there was, let's say some kind of cap on big biggies, right. So you couldn't have stompy big biggies. Um, then, and, and you were sort of forced to be more kind of evenly spread that actually creates a really interesting set of incentives, as you mentioned, to like give the turn away and what do you place in which force based on the way they change in the scenarios. And like, I you wish know, they, I wish they would have took wrath of Kings. I don't know if you, either of you ever played that. Um, I wish they would have maybe looked at that game in the way that deploys you deployed certain units were deployed either, you know, nine inches up, six inches up or three inches up. Wow. So you, you had these, you had to break down. I don't, it's been a while since I played the game, but that was one of the things that this f feels like it needs something like that. Cause then you don't have to necessarily worry. Then you engage a little bit sooner. So for those slower right. forces, you might be able to get up into the game a lot quicker. Um, so like if they, if it was broken down, maybe the deployment zone was broken down into thirds, you know, nine, six, three, um, mm -hmm. based on different, the different, unit you know i don't know some variation of that um might have been interesting no i agree and this is also where we should talk about how sort of reserve units of all kinds work right yep which is like your reserve your units all have to be assigned to one of the three forces obviously lots of forces have the ability to ambush or put stuff in reserve right we all know that right so mm -hmm. stormcast in the heavens night haunt in the spooky ghost world you know, uh, legions putting stuff in the grave, beasts ambushing from off the board, whatever, whatever, right? We all get it. There's an interesting restriction here that you cannot bring a force in from reserve before its actual, before its actual thing would deploy. Right. Right. right? Yep. So like, and if you have to, for some reason, then it just has to come in with the normal troops instead. So the easy example of this is is uh, Beast of Chaos, right? Where they can put stuff in ambush, but it has to march on the first turn. Well, so obviously that's not going to work because then the only thing you can ambush is what's in your, again, assuming standard sort of trot out of this would be spearhead. what's in your, your spearhead. Yeah. Right. right. Because you can't even bring them, or like even your main body stuff doesn't arrive until the end of turn, so you can't bring them on in right. your movement phase when they would normally mm -hmm. march on. Right. right. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just, but again, like, but that's actually kind of a neat restriction. I don't hate that. I think that's kind of cool. Like it plays with the way those reserves work, but again, stuff like, uh, armies that can hold their stuff for a longer time in, you know, off table, mm -hmm. uh, do gain a big advantage. Whereas beasts, it's like, well, I, I hope you took that command ability that lets you, or whichever one it is, it lets you wait until the... Sure the second turn well i mean you're just gonna have to build for it like sure. with a lot of these like you end up building for it and like i looked at mine and like i ended up building my rune smiter specifically for you know like my 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 uh my fire slayer specifically for the situation because i like i couldn't do anything else i i took endron riggers because i had to have mobility and shooting so that when they came in i could immediately begin to put pressure on a target across the board right yeah, it's absolutely like it's hard to it's hard to undervalue. Like take a three foot by four foot board. It's not a very big board, but it's the same distance across as our normal 2K game, right? It's just right. shorter one direction. And a lot of these setups are are horizontal in the same way as the normal game. Yep. Right? Yep. And so we often think of that as not a great amount of space because we're deploying nine inches away from enemy territory. If you're coming on at the three inch from the edge mark, yeah, yeah, right, there is forty two four. inches between yeah. you four. and your potential where your potential. You have is. four turns to travel, and if you're moving at four yeah, inches, per, you there. have four turns. Best case, yeah. yeah, yeah, you have four three two, yeah, right, depending on the force you're talking about. Yep. So, like little foot walkers who have nothing else to do. Like if you've got, if you're bringing on like some long beards or whatever, sure. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. And like in the rear guard, forget it. Yeah. Forget it. They're never they don't, they do not participate in this fight. 
unless there is an objective that just happens to be super deep in your territory. There's a couple that are close, right? There's a couple where the rear guard, like we'll get to it when we get to the missions, but there's a couple where they did actually structure. So the rear guard, when they walk on, they can walk on near an objective. So that's I'm well not, decided. I'm not entirely sure that they really thought that they were designing this for 36 by 48. I, I agree. I think that they were. I really I think, think they, they were want you to like 30 a 36 by 24 or something. I think they want you. I think they really want you in 30 to 40 on the lower end of their scale, their recommended scale. It's still big. It would still be. It is. Yeah. It's, still be 34 right. inches still. apart. It's not that much of a difference. Like it's. I agree. It's different. It's two rounds yeah. of movement for what I just talked about. But you know, yeah. for them long beards. No, yeah. <laughs> well, Tom, what was the size you suggested? 24 by what? Uh, I think it was 24 by 36. The the kill team like the kill team size. Yep, I think that that's yeah. what they're imagining here. I think we'll test that this weekend. So, okay, with that being said, let's get into the scenarios a little bit because I think these are going to help us kind of understand this a little better, right? Yep. Because the when you talk about this amorphously, yep. It's easy to say things like, "Well, the rear guard will never participate." But that's just not actually how this game plays out, right? So, again, this is where like they the ideas here of what they're doing with the scenarios are really good yep. um i actually like a lot of little things in this here here's what i would say overall i give this i, I give this the entire operation like i this is too early for a summation but i give it like i don't know i don't know if i give it a letter grade b minus right sure. because it's got a lot of really good ideas it's just there's some crippling flaws but overall it's still like those are things that could be fixed there they these are things that can be directly remedied like i see the fix that could come here in version 2.0 that will fix this stuff yep. there's no i don't see any fundamental issues right okay and that's that's what i mean there are things that are bad but they're not at the foundational level all right center ground there are six battle plans right yeah six six right? six yeah. yep okay so center ground Center ground is a single objective right in the center of the board. Territory split you down the middle. may or may not arrive at with some armies. Sure. <laughs> and this one is like, this is like the stock standard one, right? Yep. Um, Like this is like the, and by the way, some people might find that hard to believe that everything we said, I, I just, there are difference between rules problems and fundament problems, right? Fundament problems are when you have something, you have to go back to design on the engine. This is all stuff that I could fix in an afternoon. Like if Tom and I sat down, we could crack out the fixes yep. for this stuff. <laughs> the comments have fixed many of the issues already as we've been saying it. That's how easy this stuff is to fix. <laughs> so anyways. Um, okay, so one objective. This uses the completely standard stuff, right? Your spear guards, or your, sorry, your spear, spear guard, your spearhead starts, your main body shows up in turn one on one side of the table and your rear guard shows up in turn two, kind of on the other half of your zone. Yep. Great. And this is the short deployment way, which notably would mean you're playing lengthwise on a bisected tournament table. Right? Yep. <laughs> yep. Okay. Had to, had to, you got to switch your head around there. Uh, all right. So the, Blah, blah, blah. You decide who's red and who's blue, which is just a set way of saying who gets which side and who deploys first. You say you set up your spearheads one at a time. Here's an interesting thing that I thought was pretty cool. Um, the battle ends at the end of the fourth battle round. If one player has one to four more victory points than their opponent, they win a minor victory. If one player has five or more victory points than their opponent, they win a major victory. Any other result is a draw. I read that and I was like, that's kind of cool. You have to actually like that. win significantly, not eke it out. Yeah, if like I kind of mm -hmm. like that. Like when I talk about stuff that I think would be interesting to integrate into some scenarios in standard 2K, uh, I read a rule like that and I'm like, wow. Go on. Okay. I kind of dig that. Seems like it would create more separation and sort of like in a tournament, there'd be more minors, right? You yep. can't you can't get a squeaker at one and then say you suddenly got a major victory. Like that never, you know what I mean? We've all had that game yep. where it's like, oh, we just squeaked it out by one point and it was just a die roll breaking. And then all of a sudden you get the credit for a major and you're like, but was it? <laughs> was that really a <laughs> Wasn't major? it really? You know? So, like, I think that's actually a really good idea. Um, I, like, I read that and I was like, oh, 
cool design. Great. Let's, this is, that's good thinking. Bring that back. Let's port that back. Steve, what do you think about that? You like that? No, I like it. I like that. As a, as a TO, you always, you know, that's one of the, one of the issues is creating separation. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I like it. <clears throat> it works. And then we get to sort of how you get victory points. Now I'm going to read these. And again, I want to, I want to sort of track my emotional status as I read through this when I got the book last week, which was, so I'm reading through this in order because I was excited about this. And I was like, okay, let me see here. At the end of each battle round, each player adds up the wounds characteristics <laughs> of all enemy models that were slain during that battle round. The player with the higher total scores two victory points. If neither player has a higher total, each player scores one. Okay. So you get more points for killing more. That's kind of an interesting alternate thing. And then as well, at the end of each battle round, the player that controls the objective scores three victory points. If neither player controls the objective, each player scores one victory point. And I read those two and I was like, all right, that's kind of cool. I like having two different sources <laughs> of victory points. Like I've always loved yeah. the other scenarios that are out of the previous GHBs where there were like two or three ways of accruing victory points. I've always thought that more match play scenarios should have this sort of thing. Sure. So there's multiple paths to victory. And I read it and I was like, okay, so I got one sort of kill oriented one and one table taking one. And I was like, yeah, that's cool. I like that balance. I think that makes sense. I like that if you, if, if basically you get in a scrum, like there's only one objective in the middle of the table. Yep. So a scrum is very likely in which case then you just keep both getting one and kind of pair up. Yep. I was like, all right. Like that's solid. I like that design. I, I I read this and I was like, I am very happy. This is well thought out. This is good execution. Yeah. But is that where similar thoughts from both of you, or or what did you think? Yeah, like uh, I like tracking it. It it creates a very interesting incentive structure for major wins, though. When you actually get to the nuts and bolts of like scoring enough to get the major win, uh, because it be actually makes it, you know, like a journey to get that, which is not a problem, but it's just, it's a reality. No, oh, again, and something I, I actually like, think is a positive. I'm sorry, go ahead, Steve. No, I was just going to say that I, I kind of like that. Um, it, it creates that incentive to maybe take on something that you might not have thought of just to try to get that separation and score those two victory points. So I, I, I dig that. I, I like the idea of maybe sending something in in heroic fashion to try and get, get something to kill something off where normally you might not even take that risk. You know, you might, you might just say, Hey, screw that. I'm not going to get through that last kitty cat. What do you call them? Kitty, kitty, kitty caters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get through there, but you know, unless I get lucky, you know, and then maybe you, you get in there, you get lucky. It's a dice rolling game. So I kind of like that incentive. Um, I like that they put that in there. I agree. So at this point, when I started reading, I was riding high. I was like, all right. You know, like I, I, I had some problems with earlier on that we've talked about, but I read this and I was like, you are bringing this back around for me. Okay. I like where we're going. I can't wait to see what other sort of how we separate the minor and major victories from this point forward and what the victory conditions look like for the other five. I was, I was, I was thrilled. Spoiler alert. They're basically all the same. And I was like, oh, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, you had, like you thought of, <laughs> you had a really good thing and then they were just like not nope, copy paste from here we're good yeah. yeah so you know like again essentially it's just the the maps really changing them. right yeah. so right. like i i just i was so excited about these alternate like victory conditions and ways of separating and ways to accrue victory points i was like i can't wait to see what they came up what else they came up with oh never mind <laughs> it's just all the same thing. That was the big idea. Right. Yeah, which is a good idea, by the by. Right? Like, just keep going. Like, I could have given you 10 more right now off the top of my head. But, but let me just say, let me point out, Vince, that that makes it easily memorable. Because you know how scoring always works in every scenario. I understand that. But this is a, a bespoke thing, theoretically. Like, great. So don't do 10. Don't do a different, keep one the same and vary one or get three different groups of them. Sure. You got six scenarios, right? How about pairs of two? Sure. Like I, something, give me something here, man. <laughs> you know, just like, nope. come on. You know, I agree. But like at a thousand points, it's generally a little less to remember anyways, right? It's simpler to pilot your army. You have less units, less blah, blah, blah. At any rate. Okay. 
Well, they're not all exactly the same. I mean, those two those two victory conditions do carry through, but there are some. They kind of throw in a little bit of seasoning. They do. Uh, they do a little bit. Yes, I, you're yeah. you're right. Um, they're not they, all it's, vanilla. It's very templated, but we'll get to it. I don't yeah. want to be. I don't want. You're right. I don't want to be too yeah. hyperbolic. It's vanilla with some sprinkles on top. <laughs> they got some sprinkles in there. Yeah. No a chocolate. No cherry. Right. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> sprinkles. They have just absolutely some no sprinkles at it from across <laughs> the room. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. It's just a little bit of texture in your ice cream. Right. No flavor, no additional flavor, but texture. You know? Yeah, it's like they of... got it up on the counter yeah. and the person was still back there. Yeah, it's like a go. DQ. The person's yeah. still like behind the counter where they make the ice cream and they just like threw yeah. it from across the room and some some sprinkles landed off. on it. Yeah. Make him in a page and he's just like, here, take your damn sprinkles and get out of here. Right. All right. So let's talk about uh, the next one, which is Death Pass. Death Pass is actually played like long ways long <laughs> that ways. is to say the 48 inches uh, across as it were right if you're playing in this one so this is the one where you have the sort of potential where you could show up that distance apart again this one goes spearhead spearhead uh main body rear guard so yep. appropriate order the difference here is that they don't all come from the same side so this is exactly what i sort of described where your spearhead starts so you're marching 48 inches across here your spearhead comes on here your main body comes on here and your rear guard comes on here out some short distance, basically half the distance yeah. out there. So you can kind of march out toward the edge with your rear guards. You don't have to start like this full oh, distance wait. apart. Right. Yeah. You're yeah, starting like one that my son and I play. Right. You still have to be within that three inches of the edge, but you're right. moving yep. up. Well, you potentially could be at the 12 inch line of your deployment zone. That's right. Yeah. You're technically 24 from the enemies yeah. where the enemy right. is sitting when you come on with the rear guard. Yeah. Yep. Which is one, well, part, which is one thing that I actually sorry, kind of hold on. That's a lie. You're 20. When your rear guard comes on, you could potentially be 24 inches from the enemy's main body. The rear guards deploy in yeah. opposition, which makes it even farther apart. Yeah, it's, it's a diagonal line. It's the hypotenuse of the 48 inches. They yeah. are super yeah. far apart when they yeah. march on. Yeah, well, I, no, think, so. I think the thing to be wait, hold, just a second, just yeah. real quick. I mean, one of the things that jumped out to me was after looking at the scenarios, okay, and looking at deployments, it goes back to army construction. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you putting into that rear guard? And, you know, like one of the thoughts for me was something that's going to be fast, right? Something that's going to yeah, move. Absolutely. Like my Palidors, for example, zipping across the battlefield to get sure. where I need them to be, right? So, I mean, I think that that's something that. I don't know if we were clear enough in the beginning about how Tom mentioned it because he played uh, one with constructing his list around those scenarios, because that's one of those things that I don't know if it's going to be, um, you know, like in my rear guard, I'm not going to be putting something that's only going to be moving four four inches. Right. Well, At a, you know, and I know that's a drawback for some armies that don't have that ability. Right, sure. And it's also going to get that. interesting when we get to the rear guard being deployed first for one yeah, of the forces right, in a right. second. Correct. Correct. I'm sorry. I just wanted to make sure. That no, it's was, a good point. It's an excellent point. I'm not point. sure we were clear with the, with our, with our uh, the viewers. And it should so. be noted that like what actually ends up happening here is that like the turn, the deployment at the end of turn one, which is the, uh, the main body in this one, the main body ends up squaring off against the other person's uh, rear guard. Potentially, right. yes. No, like it does because they're the two closest wow. units. One comes in before the other. Right. And so you're going to be marching that way and then they're going to pop up in front of you and you're going to hit them. Sure. Like, unless like you double if, turn, right? Unless you double turn. In which case your main body will show up down here. Yeah. Right. Then yep. you'll go to your two. Your rear guard will show up up here. Right. Right. Meanwhile, they're like, they had their bottom of one already because they went first, right? And you yep. doubled. So their main body is sitting up here and you've basically had no chance to interact with it. Cause like your, your unit would have to be just lightning fast. Like I right. guess some yeah. could, yep. I mean, there's somebody who could clear that hypotenuse. There are probably units that can get 40 inches plus across the board. Sure. And like there, in fact, there are definitely some, but it's rarefied, yep. uh, but they could be teleported or handed or caliber on or whatever. So, you know, yep. whatever, that's the only chance for interaction. And then, they're going to take their two and then they're going to march their rear guard on down here next to your force, which by this point could have moved, right? But, because you had but, your, your main body could have moved. But their main body, which will have come on at the top, at the bottom of one mm -hmm. is already squared up now with your rear guard. Correct. 
at their bottom of two, and they can double turn you and get into your rear guard. Sure. So you're I thinking you, you would be blocking them up. up. That's you what don't want to take that double. Yeah. Like it's it is it is actually bad for you to take that double because what that gives them the ability to do is a chance yeah. to double and get across into your guy without think, you having any reprisal. One of the drawbacks to this is like I think that like when you when they like if like in this particular scenario, death pass. Okay, one of the things that I would like this would be like a house rule. Okay, you have the flexibility to deploy your either your main body or your rear guard. Either, either or, right? You choose based on what's going on on the battlefield. Do you mean like the side or the, the side. or are you picking yeah, that? Okay, the yeah. Side. The side. You're saying yeah. both of these sides become so valid not, choices. So it's not so predictable. I think that's right. one of the biggest drawbacks is the predictability of it. Right. And because you can then say, okay, I'm going to block this off. I know you're coming in over here. What do you got over there? But, okay. Does it say what happens if you come in? Like you can't come in within nine of an enemy, right? You cannot. So yes, you can't like, the trick is that one thing we didn't mention that we should mention is when you set up your, your like reserve ambushing units. Yes. You treat that battle. You treat any arrival edge of their battlefield. Yes. As an enemy model effectively. So you have to set up nine inches away from it. From their edge. From their edge. Your units that march on could march on within period like there's no there's no restriction it's a it's okay a so there is no restriction on it so you yeah, can't stop them out you right. cannot you can't block. yeah right you can't block them out they could set up on like into you basically okay so yeah i mean this one has two objectives by the way it's just one in each enemy territory same exact victory condition same exact victory spread right so it's yeah. three if you control more objectives one if nobody controls more, which is the likely outcome with two objectives, because again, you'll probably you'd each have control of your own, you know, until something happens. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, this one's lengthwise. It's it's interesting. Uh, it again still follows normal rules. Now is where we're going to start getting wackadoo. Okay. Oh, sorry, not yet. Scenario three is still pretty standard. Real well, quick, to, sort of. Good. On the rear guard thing that we were just chatting about, did you see Autumn Lotus's comment? And nine times out of ten, there will be no rear guard in either army. Well, there has to be something. There has to be at least one unit. You always have to sure have it could unit. be could be Does minimal. There? Yeah, yeah. every force one has unit. to have one unit. Period. Okay. All right. Now, sure. again, it could be it could be the most throwaway thing ever, right? Sure. Like your rear guard could be a griffhound, <laughs> yeah. or whatever you know. <laughs> right. You know, whatever. Just pick your favorite cheap thing of choice. Well, it couldn't be because you can't buy them solo anymore. Yeah, I just what's I, I'm trying. I was trying to think of a cheap throwaway example. Uh, An aether way. There you go. Yeah, you're your aether way. Oh no, no, a witch yeah. hunter. Ah, uh, the witch yeah. hunter. There it is. What is he? Forty points now. Yep. Right. Boom. Or, uh, if you prefer, I don't have him. I hung him up. Darn it, Tom. Uh, at the store that I went to when I was yep. hanging out up in Wisconsin. Yep. They had the what's the name of the dark elf pirate captain guy? The um oh uh yeah the black arc corsair black arc yeah the black arc fleet master yeah, yeah. okay I, I they had like. they had like yeah peg leg yeah exactly they had black arc fleet masters on sale for like nine bucks and they had a bunch of them I was like I'm grabbing one of those I can't throw down a nine dollar fleet master that's forty points of quality <laughs> thank you thank you Autumn yes well it's forty points yeah I was like. Come on now, it's a great model. He really is a cool yes, model. So yes. uh at a at a discount rate of nine dollars. So Chimera Hobbies in, in Appleton, Wisconsin, if you want to uh Get if you want to go pick it up. All right. Borderline. Uh you know, much like Madonna, you keep pushing me past the borderline. So this one is the diagonal deployment. Whoop. So we go whoop. We bisect the table like that. Yeah. And what's different here is you start with your main body. And so, like, if this is the line of the table, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. One army starts here, and one army starts here. So, again, you have the biggest possible distance on the, on the horizontal, I should say, to march across, right? So it's not lengthwise completely. It's not this. You have the biggest horizontal distance to march across. It's about 30 inches distance on the straight line. So, you know, whatever the hypotenuse is there, but depending on how it works out, but you do have to the halfway mark. 
So like technically you could have units that are just like on that 30 inches, right? Cause they could be like this. Right. Because your, your deployment lines are like, are like this. I wish we had pictures of this we could share, but they should publish some free PDFs of this so I can share them. Um, <clears throat> said I'm just happy to use the scream. I hope everybody enjoys this, this like hand action I'm doing tonight. This is a very hand action heavy show. Uh, and then comes your, so main body first. Then a turn one is your spearhead, and then a turn two is your rear guard. Great. Same victory conditions. Three objectives along the, the line. No. Okay. Mm. Cool. All right. Mm. The raid. Uh, the raid is, again, horizontal cut. Four yep. objectives. Again, starts with your main body. Coming from like here and here, actually opposed to each other, like the full full table side. Yep. And then your see, this is where it gets to what you were talking about earlier, Steve, where there's actually some variability. Right. Your rear guard comes in next, so it goes main body, then rear guard, and again has the full length of the table to play with, right? Yep. And then at the end, that's when your spearhead shows up. Your spearhead shows up, marching in from either side. Right. In turn two, this split. actually is is quite. I like this one. This is like the one scenario where they did alternate it in an interesting way. This is the creative one mm -hmm. because it takes what's normally first and makes it last, which I enjoy. Yeah. So that plays with your list building, right? And moving the spear guard, which could be weighted with, again, maybe like some kind of unit that can go in and grab, which is going to be relevant in a moment because this one actually has a different victory condition because it's a raid to go burn objectives. So the objectives are like one, two, three, four in the territory, right? Yeah. And it's one of those, like, you can burn enemy objectives things, like like a sort of scorched earth type situation, right? And starting from the second battle round, you can raise an objective if you, in, you control in your enemy territory. If you do, you score D3 victory points and the objective is removed from play. So again, the fact that the spearhead can come on from either side, that it's not locked, the fact that your main body and your rear guard have the whole horizontal to play with, as opposed to like a very restricted, predictable yeah. space, like many of the other ones. And the fact that there is that interesting third victory condition that plays with it. This one's good. Like, yeah. I like this one a lot. This one. Yeah. So I, I read the first one on super high, I read the next two. And I was like, wait a minute. These are the same. And I got to the fourth one. I was like, Oh, I'm back on board. All yeah. right. You're bringing me back. You could split up the spearhead too. And it's coming in on both sides. Couldn't you? You don't have yeah. to choose. Yeah, yeah. No, you don't. They're just both. They're, they're both your deployment it's zone. Yeah. Even, it's even more dynamic in that sense. It's not like you're still, you know, you're, you're locked. Not, yeah, not locked into one side or the other. You can use both sides. So I like yeah. that a lot. No, I think the raid is a good scenario. I think this one's solid. Yeah, I like it. Tom, thoughts on this one? Yeah, I don't know. I just look at all this and I'm like, cool. I'm gonna play night haunt and ignore all deployment rules. Right. I mean, like, tell me, tell me that something like that isn't the right answer. Doesn't half of your army still have to be on the board? Nope. Nope. I'm not Stormcast. Oh, do can I, I thought Night Hunt still had the same rule. Don't they have to, yeah. Don't you have some on the board? Don't you have to rotate? You don't have to rotate back and forth. I can, I'll, I'll, let me double check. I'm but pretty I know sure you're are, a cheater I with your you army here. I think you have to one in the underworld, one on the board, one on the underworld, one on the board. I, I think that's, that's right. again, that's fine. Uh, uh, You're definitely uh, at an advantage because you can just pick up your army and redeploy it wherever, whenever you want for a command point. Sure, 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 sure. No, I mean, yes, I agree. Night hunt that that ability to move things around is is you know it's, it's good. It's man, it's good. It's good. Yeah, things with that kind of teleport, you know, pretty good. Yeah, it's one for one. Thank you. Um, you cheater. I don't even play that force. I don't even care about spooky boys. All right. Um, oh, the battle plan maps are in the AOS app. Oh, cool. Neat. Okay. Thank you, Robert. I did not know that. I'll go take a look at them. I still can't show them on this screen, but that's good to know. <laughs> that's pretty cool. That's cool that they put the meeting engagement ones yeah. in there. That's good. that's good. All right. Two more. Here we go. Let's talk them through real quick. Number one, rear guard actions. This has three objectives. Across here, again, it's played on the lengthwise, so the four yep. foot, you're deploying here to here. You, This one's actually really interesting because you don't both set up from the same force. Did you catch that? Yeah. Yeah. 
So yep. normally you're deciding like who's red team and who's blue team. And it doesn't really matter that much. Like other than just who's dropping yeah. first. Right? right. This time it matters because yep. the red player sets up units from their spearhead and the blue player sets up units from their rear guard. And yep. those oppose each other on the lengthwise. So blue sets up their rear guard over here and red sets up their spearhead over here. Yeah. Right. right. Yep. You see and then basically able to choose matchups. Yeah. And then, then like your main body has this real small deployment space over here and here that's turn one. And then whatever didn't set up comes on here and here. Right. Mm -hmm. And again, same exact victory conditions and victory points and stuff. But that's interesting that like that could, so like if you, if you do have your army with just like some chaos warhounds or whatever, a single chaos chariot, I don't know. Right. I'm trying to think of funny things to end up in your rear guard. Uh, they're like, you set down that thing. If you're in, if you're on the, on the, uh, on the blue team and you're like, okay, I'm done. Right. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> well, right. and then you're going to choose first turn because you finished deploying first. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If, well, assuming yes, <laughs> We, mm -hmm. we don't know that, but yes, that's that would seem to be the logical statement. You know, this this battle plan makes me, uh, you know how it, you know how I love sideboards, right? I, so, I do. This is one of those, the, when I saw this battle plan, the first thought I had was like, all right, imagine if you started off, if you're playing in an event, and it's basically, here's your thousand points, and then you can reassign your main body, spearhead, and rear guard game to game. So you yep. weren't locked in, yep. right? That to me is like really enticing. I like that idea. So that when you rock up, when you, you roll up, you say, okay, I'm the red team. Okay, I got to, this is what's going to be in my spearhead, right? And then, yep. so so you're not necessarily at a disadvantage based on the luck of the draw. Um, I, I think that's, I'm, I'm intrigued to play test that, to see how that, to see how that works in these scenarios to give you ultimate flexibility to like, you know, you're coming to the battlefield. Here's what I'm going to do. And this yeah. In other words, you kind of, you get, you get to show up with your thou. I like what you're going here. Let me, let's explore yeah. this for a moment. This is a good idea. In other words, you show up with your thousand point list and that has some number of units on it, right? Whatever right. it is. Right. And the rules remain the same as far as what goes in what, right. Yeah. But you show up, you both, both players see the scenario, see the enemy yeah. list see the enemy list you guys you know exchange list or whatever like your total list and then you basically then go and say then you go down the line and you say this one's in the spearhead this one's in the main body this one's in the rear guard you kind of assign them as per what's legally available yep that's I actually an interesting idea that that's how you always did it on my first read or two was that okay. like you would because it, it didn't say exclusively and then i realized when i went back and read it i read the tournament rules trying to figure out like if you can change what's in what deployment because I felt like that was a deployment step, not a, but I, then I realized it was in the list building step and because yeah. it's in the list building step, it gets locked in for tournaments. But I, originally I thought that you could move that around, which made this whole thing more interesting. Yeah, so. I would definitely. Yeah. Um, I like moving I, it around. I support moving it around, but that's just me. No, I agree. I think that's a much cooler way to go about it. And that's what I mean when I say, like, the problems here aren't foundational. This is stuff that we could easily fix, right? Like, again, right. version two of this, this has a lot of really interesting things going on. Keep building on this, and we've got a great version of this, right? So I'm okay with it. Like, put it out here. Classically, this is what's happened. Like, things show up in the GHB. They're kind of experimental. And then they they mature into bigger things, right? Yep. Right. This isn't weird. This is the same thing that has happened multiple times before. Sure. Um, if you're surprised by this, stop. Stop being surprised by this repeatedly happening. So, and that's basically it. They have some, you know, stuff on like how to run a tournament. They have a couple of, you know, sample schedules, results forms, blah, 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 blah. blah. About changing priorities. Oh, sorry. Yeah, changing priorities. Thank you. The sixth scenario. Sixth scenario is basically pretty standard, like, it's it's it is a spearhead main body rear guard standard yep. thing the difference is there's three objectives so it goes the short way across how you deploy it's three objectives and the one that's worth more changes every round yep 
that's basically it. It Very uses the standard. same victory conditions with like a very literally the slightest deviation. Yeah. yeah. I would have um, liked to have seen this. I would have preferred to see this build off of um, the raid. So, like, I would have liked to have seen the main body be able to be split among uh, in across like each. across so, like, both sides. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that would have been. In fact, like when we play this in the base, that's probably what we'll do to add some variety to this scenario, a little bit more flex tactical flexibility, um, give you some options that that. Uh, just because it's, it feels a little staticky. Like, I like right. the way Rear Guard Action works, that battle plan. Yeah. Um, and then I really like the raid. Those are the two that shine for me in this. Um, and I would have liked to have seen them do, did something a little bit different than the standard kind of deployment, if you will, within changing priorities. I would have liked to have seen some, something. Good. Yeah, in my opinion, like, uh, Borderline is also decent enough because it's on the short... It's on the short deployment, and because the way the line stretches, you can actually get out there with your your sort of main body or whatever, and you start with the main body. So it's kind of an interesting flip on the script where you're yeah. kind of getting your main force out there. If I were to pick my three, it would be also because Borderline has three objectives, and yeah. so hence it actually is the one where there's an uneven number, hence you can get it two and get the three victory points yeah. and blah, 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 blah. It doesn't end up scrummy. Um, so like Borderline the Raid... And rear guard are the three I I think are really interesting. Yeah, those. Yeah, yeah. agreed. It's yeah. funny. Like I look at this and I think, man, it could be really interesting to integrate this into like a narrative campaign, where sure. you maybe leave, oh, yeah. bring maybe bring like like your army quote unquote is three thousand points, and then you <laughs> then you build for different types of encounter. Like so, and you could even say like this is the apportionments of your army. And then when you have to build out certain things, they have to come from those, those portions of your armies in your grand army uh, right. for your meeting engagement, you know, encounter and for this or that or whatever. Like, I think there's yeah. some real potential here. Right. I also see it as kind of a compliment to Paths the Glory. Yeah. I remember Paths the Glory? Cause we still sure. play that here. Well, the thing you could easily build into is, is in, oh, into this, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, when I look at this, I think like, you know, just to, it sounds like we've been banging on this hard, but I really do want to make my opinion clear. There are some real critical issues with this. Okay. That in my humble opinion, let me just, we have entered opinion right. phase. Um, there are some very critical issues with this that need addressed, but I think the fundamental conception of this, the idea of it is very strong. It's interesting. It just like most of this can be fixed with tweaks uh, let's talk about the big, let's talk about like, kind of, let's trot out a couple fixes. We've already done, let's codify some of these. Let's play armchair designer for a moment. How sure. do you limit big things? What's your limit for big things? Mine or everybody's? Just whatever. What, how do you, you're, you're, you're king for a day. You can change the rules. How do we, how do we stop your, your, the scenarios we've talked about? How do we stop the, the GG and, you know, how do we, how do we stop the kumquat? How do we stop the... Ethereal Velazda, how do we stop this crap? What's the answer? I go with what I do for Holy Havoc, which okay. is like, you, you can't have those big boys. You just can't. It, 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 I would limit in, it. In what to, way? Like, are you making a well, list? Are you saying no model over X points? No special I, characters? Because obviously well, the, the Ethereal Velazda is not a character, right? I mean, like a special character. It's not a unique character, I should right. say. Yeah. Um, mm, I don't know. That, 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 I know what I do. That would be my first impulse is to, to, to limit, um, and not necessarily keyword, but maybe it's wounds, um, a wounds cap. Um, eh, that doesn't work either. Um, uh, 300 but, points, name characters, done. Yeah. I I don't think you should have named characters to be That's honest. what I'm saying. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Oh, okay. I'm you, sorry. I missed uh, that. The, uh, it can it cannot violate either of these, you know, prohibitions, which is it cannot be a name character and it cannot be over three hundred points. That's so we just kind of accept that, like we we already accepted artificial limitations on endless sure. spells. Only one. We've I'm, already accepted. I'm artificial walking through the natural yep. pushback because what's going to yep. happen when you say that is somebody's going to say, "Oh, what? Like Lotan's broken? 
right? Like that's what, you're going to get low tan thrown in your face. Yeah, and I'm going like, to go anytime yeah. someone yeah. says no yeah, character. Sorry, low tan. You can low tan is is this, the this counter example. Somebody was already hold on, hold on. thinking it. Hold on. Sorry, low tan. You can sit this one out like you always do. <laughs> right. Like like every <laughs> other game ever. Yes. Right. right. Um, well, that would be my first. That would be my first impulse. And I say that. With some reservation, because in my events, you know, I put a cap on those kind of things anyway. Um, well, at least for at least for Holy Havoc, I do. But so I, you're saying I, nothing you, greater than 300 points, and yeah, I know nothing greater than 300 points. And just to you know, just to be clear, so a 300 um, point model is okay. No, yes, 300 points fine. 310 is not. So it has to be, uh, you know, like it, or you could even say it has to be under 300. So points. just to be clear, Beast Claw Raiders are not allowed to play this game. Yes. <laughs> okay just i just trying to figure this out because like their stuff is like 323 no they have non-hero they have non-heroes i don't have their points in front of me but i'm pretty sure all no, their they like have, no, all their they big hero like, stuff is like more than hunters and oh, get uh, out of here with that you know, like you those could, aren't real you could play them no just, play player them. owns ice brow hunters get out of here that you're is ridiculous play them with the models that you've never played before oh my is god the key. Sorry, BCR players, you continue to not count. I don't know what to tell you. Um, I mean, yeah, I would say no name characters and no um <laughs> Let me say, poor on. poor Halo. Just, just short end of the stick every time. Every time. Okay, so there it is. You say it can't be over 300. So they get Stonehorn Beast Riders. That's what they get. Oh well, hot you do. None and of the they characters. They get born packs. They get ice fall yetis. They get frost sabers <laughs> and ice brow hunters. Boom. Do you do you honestly think like you're naming good things right now? Like I'm trying to figure out where your head's at. It, this is like uh, no. I mean, but I I don't even know the names of the units. Why? Which is why I had to pull it up and look at the points. I understand. It's like I feel like if this were some kind of wrestling match. What would need to ha what would happen right now is from from you know like backstage, yep. Haywo Twitch would just come running in with like a steel chair, and I would just <laughs> tag him in, and he would just be smashing you, like sure. that's what would happen. Um, I mean, the problem is, is that like, <laughs> Haywo said, Ice Brow Hunter times four, thirty Frost Savers trophy, please. <laughs> Done. Um, I, like you could go up to three twenty or three sixty. It wouldn't like, matter. None of it's going to fit their their things in. What? They're yeah. all more the three forty would. You get one of their heroes in. No, and then like the Husker on Stonehorn is three twenty. The th uh, the Thunder yeah, yeah, yeah. Beast Rider is three twenty. Like you could get some of them in at three twenty, three forty. It's just three hundred is a really clean number. Um, sure. Uh. But I mean, like you need to cut out most of the silliness, um, and could you get you that. Out, could Tom? Could do you think you could cut out the silliness if, like, you reduce the leader allocations? No, nope. Are you no, going because to all you need is one in the main body? Yeah, but if but yeah, you, right, let's think about this for a minute. Just hold on a second. Let's just think about it for just a minute. Like you okay. said, okay. So you're sitting here and you're saying, okay, let's use Marathi as the example then. Sure. Um. You cannot you weed her out other than saying no name. Say again. You could weed her out saying no unique characters, so that's no, fine. No, like, but, but let's, let's, let's hold on a second. Like, if you just said that, let's say your leader, you were only allowed like one. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yep. Um, and given the fact that the and that let's say that that leader would have to be a part of your let's say main body. Sure. Right. Yeah. right? All right. You would then restrict to when they could come on the board. Yep. Sure. And then restrict certain command abilities, command points, right? Sure. Then your rear guard, you know, you can double size any unit, right? In your rear guard. Yep. So in your rear guard potentially could be coming on late game, let's say potentially 80 marauders, right? Yep. Could you, you could get 80 marauders coming in. End game, top, potentially swiping and grabbing, grabbing, grabbing objectives at the end. You know, she's not necessarily going to kill that entire unit, right? Uh, I mean, let's think about it. I mean, like I'm no. just saying, couldn't you couldn't you get in there? It's more bodies, right? 
to claim she the objective. She raises herself and goes in on a bunch of marauders that she outbraveries. Look, I'm not. She could, she could easily throw forty, and wait, 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 wait. she could easily throw forty wounds. And on top of that, let me push that one farther. Um, they only have one hero, which means if that hero is not within range, they're going to battle shock off the no, table. I, I get that, but I'm just saying that she would need to be, depending on the scenario and where she is and with these objectives, and we looked at how how you have to deploy from certain edges, from certain zones. I don't I, – I'm not com completely – I guess I'm not completely sold that – that could wound up you could wind up winning given the victory conditions too in these scenario in these battle plans and mm -hmm. how they're not like what we're conventionally used to restricting um, the game to only one hero is going to be a lot more crippling for more army like that's not your fix that's true. it's way too heavy-handed so like yeah, what okay. was your one hero for stormcast uh lord wait do i still have the points restriction what do i still have the I points restriction uh yeah, no, or, I thought in Steve's scenario he was just saying one hero because I was going to say Lord Celestin on Star Drake with a with a shield. Right. Well, yeah, so, and yeah. you could do that, but uh, <laughs> but that's the point. Like they're like you're not going to get any of the other things out of out of out of the heroes. Or like I think about yeah. other armies that need multiple heroes. To yeah. Function. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just that's really fair. heavy handed. It is heavy handed, but I mean, we're also talking about something that's not the conventional game, right? I mean, yep. we're, we're being, we're not deploying everything at one time. Sure. So they are putting a restriction on us already by telling us when and where these units can come on. Yeah. Um, I think the better way to do it is to have one unit or restrictions of no un unit over X number of points. And you can even do unit, by the way, you wouldn't even have to limit heroes. And so, like, if you didn't want uh, mm. a double size uh, kitty cater unit, sure, right? You know, which is yeah. four hundred and forty points. You know, or no, yeah, that's sorry, sorry, no, it's six hundred points. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you didn't want a double size kitty cater unit, you just say no units over three hundred and twenty points. No, no units over three hundred points. Sure. Oh, let me ask this question. Okay. Are most of our nightmare scenarios we're sketching out here, like whatever, six kitty caters, whatever. Okay, fine. I'm still not sure that's like, yeah, it's a lot of wounds or whatever. It's it's not that many wounds, I guess. What is it, 30 wounds? I mean, yep. all right. On a four-up save with no other defense? Like, yep. okay. Like, Rock they're killy, and they're fast yeah, enough. Run in charge and... Sure, they're fast enough, but they're like, they're not one of the lightning units in the game. Okay. Like, they're fast. Yep. yep. They're not like enlightened on disc or something. Sure. Or like Slanesh Seekers, who will go forty inches in a turn. Yeah. Um, the let me propose this option to you. Yep. Okay. If a unit is both a leader and a behemoth. Okay. If it has yep. both of those things. Yep. It always shows up with the last force to to arrive. Okay. Right. Which yep. means the first time it can act is turn three, right? Yep. Yeah. Meaning that, at, if anything, it, like that's a pretty crippling thing. Basically, those big dudes only get to play half the game. Yeah. Right. And and then and then Marathi rolls up and it's like, "What's up, bitch?" I understand. We could. You can still. I, I'm down with the special characters, the unique characters not being here. Like that's an easy enough one to slap on. And yes, I'm willing to throw low tan and the sloppy bile piper and. And any other oh, silly thing like that. Oh, not named. Astria oh. Solbright and, and whatever else you want to pick. Sure. I'm willing to bin all of them. Corgus call. He's in the bin. Like these are smaller point games. Get them. It, it, it's in the bin. Okay. They're all in the bin. Fine. Like, but my point is like, that solves Marathi's this unique situation. There is nobody else who like, isn't a behemoth and then becomes a behemoth. Sure. Um, and so, like, that would still... Going with that, you probably don't need to do... You say, no unique characters. If something is both a leader and a behemoth, it shows up with the last force to arrive. Regardless of what that force is, right? Yep. It just automatically slots into whatever that force is. Yep. By the way, regardless of whether that force would normally allow it. Sure. You understand what I mean? Yep. Like, because yep. if, if the spearhead goes last, technically you can't put those in the spearhead. Yeah. 
It just, who cares? It, it overwrites that. Yeah. And that makes sure that that thing only gets to participate in half the game. That puts such a perverse incentive on selecting them that they're probably become a bad choice. Right. Right. Um, whereas like, uh, uh, you Sorry, know, beast call Raiders. Sure. I mean, sure. Look, just, we're, we're, we're just take it BCR. Like you're going to get it here some way or another. You don't get to play in this format. I don't know what to tell you. Get, get, uh, get it, get a new book where more and Fang are good and they'll be rock and roll. Right. Cause I'll just roll in with like a bunch of more and Fang or something. If they did get a new war scroll and a new kit for like the ice brow and the cats, that'd be perfect. If he wasn't like hot Chinatown garbage, right? Like him and a bunch of more and Fang would actually be super cool. Uh, if they weren't crap, but anyway, uh, yeah, like then you just say no unique and they show up late and bing bang boom now the incentives are to have smaller leaders or interestingly uh behemoths that aren't leaders right watch out for that black coach sure like you know a gorgon or something right like that's that kind of stuff becomes not as costly nobody's running a gorgon you shut your face he's cheaper now you don't know you don't know what people are doing you don't know what's you don't know what's going on in the world, Tom. You don't know nothing. Uh, no, I don't know. Just my point is those kind of monsters, which are generally overlooked because they're overshadowed by their leader behemoth brethren. Yes. Right. Uh, what I'm flipping the incentive structure on them. Yeah. So, right. water, water brute. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, I mean, the point is, hey, well, sure, you could still take a terrorgeist, like without a dude on top, but the terrorgeist without the dude on top isn't that terrible. Like, no, uh, he does have scary. items. He yes. doesn't have items. He doesn't have the mount traits. He doesn't have always strikes first. He doesn't have always right. strikes first, then strike again. He doesn't have strike when he gets killed. He doesn't have strike when he gets killed again. <laughs> like, he just He's just a pretty scary monster who's also like 300 points. Like the regular terror guys ain't tearing up the charts. All That's all I'm saying. Nobody's like, got to get more of them hot, unmounted terror guys into the list. So, you know. Anyway. Mm -hmm. uh just a thought uh so that that could be another way to solve it all right but there you go the point is there's some ways to solve it we already solved the arrival edge thing make a bigger area or make things touch the board edge i'm fine with either i'd rather it just be a six inch zone yeah it seems that's real easy that's what i would do six inch zone. and then you still say if for some reason something cannot fit in there because the base is larger in all dimensions than six inches, then the yep. back edge must touch. Yep. Right? You got like great, simple enough. So when the person takes the war mammoth, they can still play with their toy. Yep. Because that would fit in these lists. And it would not be, and because you're not limiting on points, it definitely fits and stomps on everything. Sure. It's cool. It's a cool, it's a cool. I mean, whatever. It's a big, it's a big stompy elephant. I don't know that it's like end all be all in this kind of format, but it's a cool, cool elephant. Um yeah, and then I think just some of the scenarios need tweaking with some different stuff. Is there anything else we would need to change? Like, is there anything else we might I would change the list construction for sure. The flexibility. Uh, oh, yeah, change it to be... I like your idea, Steve, a lot, where you kind of show up with your 1,000 points and then you assign yeah. the roles. It's just like kill team. You know, you show up with your kill team and you just yep. you put on whoever you want on the board. And that's the way you do it. And that's the way I would do this. If I was going to do this, if I was going to bring any of this into the holy event, that's one of, that would be the main one of the main things. Good idea. I like it. No, I like that idea a lot. I think that's a, that is a great idea. And like you would actually be assigning less units here to roles quite likely than you are in most kill teams. Yes, yeah. for sure. <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. Um, the other thing that um, the other thing that I would do is the flexibility of um, I would probably add more of the um, mixed side arrival yeah, areas definitely, yeah definitely i would add that in probably to all of them to be honest with you um, yeah i feel like the scenarios just need a little like just a little tweaking around the edges like again core concepts good we just need to kind of I would massage just a little. Say, like on what i would what i would do is um yeah i'm gonna experiment with that idea the idea that you you know having multiple like yep. right now yeah multiple options of where you deploy um anyway um yeah it's a good first start i think it's a good first start I, i'm not down on it at all um no. i think that there's some there are some 
core fundamental house rules, the stuff we've already talked about with deployment, the stuff I'm going to do for sure with the list, we're going to play it like, okay, look, here's a thousand points. You do what you want with it. Um, and I think that, I think it's a good first start. Um, I, re I, I do. I think there's some, there's some things that I think I like Tom's point that they've already, they've already hard capped certain things. I think they need, they definitely need to look at it and hard cap. Like we just, that we just kicked around, you know, the leaders and stuff like that. And figure out. Sorry, Marathi doesn't go on skirmishes. That's beneath her. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I agree. That's the other thing too. I guess my my thought with the whole my initial thought with meeting engagements was like, all right, this is cool. This is kind of more narrative in in, in being a neo that appealed to me. So like my thought would be, yeah, you wouldn't be having a a, a um a unique character would not be engaging on that showing level. up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no because you could literally get into a situation with characters like that, like Marathi where she shows up on the board and she's standing there with like 10 witch elves. And that's the whole thing that just walked onto the board. Like lady, what are you doing? Yeah. Exactly. This is my honor guard. Like, where oh are you? What has, are you lost? Yeah, like what? <laughs> exactly. We can sell those roses on the battlefield. Yeah. So yeah, good potential, good first start, some room to grow. Um, I, this is the kind of thing where I think I'll, I'll see a version two and be like, yep, got it. You know, I mean, and that's fine. When we, when I look at like back at the original battle plans, when they first came out, like the 2016 battle plans or whatever, right. They weren't, there were, there were, there were challenges, <laughs> you know, yeah, like right. we, but we forget about it as things have been refined over time. Yeah. Same with path to glory and same with, same with, same with, same with. Right. So. Right. I want the other thing that I would like, I know we didn't touch on it, um, but it's the meeting engagement tournaments. One of the things mm -hmm. I like in there is that they, they put in that you must choose six hidden agendas. And I think that might change a little bit of the flavor of how this play experience goes within meeting engagements. If you had these hidden agendas and you made them a requirement, we don't usually use those hidden agendas in pitch battles, you know, that we play in tournaments, but in this like smaller setting, that might be an interesting, um, that might be those uh, chocolate chips instead of the sprinkles mints um, into this stuff. Um, sure. That adds a little more flavor to the scenarios which could then have an impact on how and what, how you're designing your list in that more creative list design concept that we discussed earlier, where you're, you're, you have the flexibility to change things up. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure about the hidden agendas in general, but I heard somebody made a list of some pretty hot schemes that have a little, that have a, a really solid amount of dynamism and make for some really interesting secondaries. I can't I, imagine. I've heard that some tournaments have used them to great success. I don't know. I don't know what to think of it. Seems like a seems like that would be the avenue I would probably go down if it was if it was me. You know, I'm just as a as a neutral third party, as it were, right? Um, yeah, you know, this makes me want to do a write up. Like this is a holiday weekend. I'll have some time where I'm just sitting around, uh, where I'm not painting because I'm hanging out with a wife or whatever. I think I, I think that we should distill this down into a little write up and publish it as a little little Google Doc for everybody. What do you think about that? It'd be fun. Yeah. Potential yeah. suggested changes for meeting engagements. Herein is the planeth to improveth upon said engagements so that they sure. are balanced heretofore for with. That kind of thing. Yeah, great. Cool. Don't I'll see agree. if I can get that written up this weekend. That'll be fun. Uh all right. Anything else we want to say on uh meeting engagements? If I if I do that, by the way, I'll tweet out the link and I'll for everybody so there you go ah yeah no Valkia that's a shame but such is life she's her her assignment somebody mentioned in the comments no unique characters would be no Valkia sure okay that's a shame because yeah. she'd actually be pretty good in this format but that's but I'm I am willing to lose her so you know you know what they say about omelets so there you go yeah any final thoughts gentlemen no all right. For me. Thanks for having me on. Hey man, I'm glad to have you on. I'll be interested to see how this goes. I, like this is good. I can't, I obviously I am very excited about, you know, what you kind of do with this in your own play testing and how this translates into the holy events. What, if anything you borrow out of here, Steve, you've never been a, you've never been a guy who, uh, 
feels compelled to live on the rails. And that's why I love your tournaments. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, uh, that's not our style. <laughs> you heard uh, like Frank Sinatra's My Way once and you were like, yes, this yes. is, yeah, I sure. hear you there. For sure. I mean, there's, there's definitely some stuff there. Um, it's definitely intriguing. I mean, I was, I was thinking about removing the Intel mission. I had been play testing some new, new Intel missions and um, then took a look at these and thought to myself, Hmm, maybe not. So maybe not, maybe they'll be back this year. So we'll see. There you go. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, there we go. Tom closing thoughts. You're good. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to, I mean, I'm going to play it almost exclusively with my son. Sure. Like, like that's what, like, it's going to be our new format just because it, like, I will say it's faster. Like it yeah, feels sure. faster. Um, be like, because your turns move faster, like yeah. getting stuff down, moving like, because you're not juggling everything on the whole army from turn one. Um, right. and so it, uh, so there's some value to that. And so I think like, you're, that's one thing we didn't mention. This could be a good, a good um, way to get people into the game in a, that is super worth mentioning because again, yeah. then you can also like, regardless of any rules changes, right. You can like, uh, Oh, wait, Mr. Hold on. Mr. Mephisto said, is this better or worse than skirmish? Better. Definitely. Like that's a full better. Yeah. Like that's, I'm yeah. not sure that that's, I'm not, that's not a tough bar to limbo under though. I've but, been trying to get, hold on before you go any further, Vince. I mean, I, the reason I bring it up is because I've been trying to get three new players involved in the game. Yeah. And when, when you're trying to expose somebody to the game and you go full bore, it's just so overwhelming that they're just like, what? You know, they can't get their heads around it right away. When I'm saying new gamers, I'm talking about people who have no experience with the game. Yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a perfect, I think this is a perfect setup to get those new players involved. Yeah. Because it, it's very, it's, it's at that faster pace. It's a shorter game. Um, they get a little mix and a flavor of everything, and it kind of it's more manageable and smaller, right? And it's more manageable. It's like bite-sized pieces for them. So I think it's I think that to get if you're looking at a way to try to introduce new players into your club, um, or it, this could be the a great way to do that. No, I actually think that's a hundred percent correct because it also disrupts most of the problems. Right. That is to say, like, if you're talking with a new player, they're not going to go build their list. You're going to hand them a little list. Right? right. And you're and like you're going to make sure that neither one of you is playing with some like monster, you know, monster nonsense. Right. that's going to make it unfun. You know, right. you can make just two balance lists that'll have a good time playing against yeah. each other and and you can introduce them. Right. And, and then you're good to go. You could have four, maybe five units. And you kind of walk them through it and they'll get a taste of everything. And it can be a fun way to experience the game, you know? Right. I really do believe that. I believe that there, there there's that potential here. Sure. So, you know, as like, that's how, that's how I'm sure. Do mention in the comments, you could also just play one K like normally and do the same thing without this extra, this extra player. stuff on top. But sure. It's the concept. He's right. And definitely. I mean, that's, that's what I would do, but it's still the concept of like, okay, wait a minute. I only have to put down this one unit to start. Okay. You know, like, mm -hmm. like so often when you're coaching somebody who's got no experience with a word tabletop war gaming, you have to go and you're telling them, okay, you've got those six units and then they don't necessarily see it that way in the, their first, their first go. It's like this mass of models. And it's like, it is overwhelming. I mean, I've seen it with these three guys. There's three buddies that I'm trying to break into the game. And I had to actually scale it back even further for that, for, for a few of them just so that they weren't so overwhelmed with the dice rolling and all the different things that go on and all the different synergies. And this kind of breaks it up a little bit into more digestible bits for those players. No, I agree. Like, that's why I think there is value over just a 1K thing, arguably, right? I could see both, but the argument here would be you could literally set the army down in front of the person. They got five units. You say these two things come on right away. You're going to set these up at the beginning. Yep. Then in turn two, in turn at the bottom of your first turn, you're going to put these two on. And then at the bottom of two, you're going to walk this last thing on. Right. And that's, and you just, Boom, boom, boom. And that way they have a very small amount of things they're they're manipulating at any point in time. When they're first learning how to move and run, they're only doing it with one or two units. There's not, yeah. you're not getting, you're not going to let them get into like probably five different combats all at once, right? Because there's, it's more limited into what can be engaging. So yeah. it's a way to kind of stretch it out. So it's a, a more controlled and streamlined experience for them as they first come in, because yeah. every new thing they have to ingest is something, right? Yeah. 
I, I have a lot of optimism for it because it's in the GHB. They gave it. They gave it. Um, what I feel they gave it some attention. Uh, I don't think it was just an afterthought. Could have been thought out better, but I'm optimistic, and I hope it comes back next year, and I hope we see it further development. Yeah, agreed. Totally agreed. Like there's potential here. It's just to be capitalized on. All right, cool. Well, that's meeting engagements. There you go. And with that. I think that brings our coverage of the GHB 2019 to a close, or it would, because next week the FAQ is going to happen probably, and we're going to be right back in it. But that's the book itself. Uh, so there you go. Steve, <laughs> pleasure as always, buddy. It's great to hang out with you. Thanks, uh, for all of you out there, we certainly appreciate you watching. Happy uh, it is now ticked over, so at least on the East Coast. So. Happy 4th of July here in the States and so on and so forth. I hope everybody, I hope you have the day off. I hope you get a good day of painting and hobbying and, uh, and or time with your family and or both, whatever you want. I hope it's a relaxing day for everybody. But we certainly appreciate you watching. And as always, we'll see you next Wednesday. <laughs>